since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. Why e stablecoin could be a game changer in the present scenario. The stablecoin industry has been under fire ever since the terror crash last month. After the disaster, a bunch of stablecoins lost their pegs, raising doubts about their stability in the volatile environment. Traditionally, stablecoins have their values pegged to other financial instruments, such as fiat, commodities and more, so that they ensure their price stability by maintaining reserve assets as collateral or through algorithmic formulae that control supply. The concept of e-stablecoin. Scientists at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California have designed Electricity Stablecoin or e-stablecoin, a fully decentralized token whose value is pegged to that of electricity. And this is for the first time that a stablecoin's value has been pegged to something other than financial instruments. As per news reports, researchers and scientists have stated that the e-stablecoin would essentially be a physics-based cryptocurrency that would link electrical energy and blockchain technologies in a unique way. The e-stablecoin would allow the electricity to be transmitted between users without needing a grid-based system. And this unique stablecoin is aimed to provide solutions to the stability factor through the concept of statistical mechanics. Some of its key features are its users will be able to mint them and they are beneficial to users with low electricity prices. The e-stablecoin is expected to be backed by and convertible into one kilowatt hour of electricity. The entire process is expected to be based on smart contracts in a decentralized cloud storage. The e-stablecoin is developed on the proof of concept consensus and has added the element of reasoning. However, as it's still in the initial phase, scientists believe further advancements could be made depending on its speed, transaction costs and more. Future of the concept. E-Stablecoin has the option of developing stablecoins whose value is pegged to other commodities. A more comprehensive study into the electricity-backed stablecoin could bring developers to work on a similar model in the future. However, for its success in the long run, it's essential to see the feasibility of having such an asset-backed stablecoin. And besides, experts and market participants will have to deeply study the functioning of such a stablecoin. Thanks for joining us on this report. If you do like the information, let us know by liking, sharing and commenting on the video below. Subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, you'll be notified of the most recent videos from Calkine. And also we update our website regularly, calkinemedia.com. Please check it out. My name is Sage for Calkine Media. Crypto talk by Calkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Calkine. Cube is an industrial sector company and it deals in logistics. The company is also developing and managing strategic properties into inland rail terminals, bulk terminals and related logistics facilities. 
the KFM Diversified Infrastructure and Logistics Fund was admitted to trading on the Australian Securities Exchange in January 2007. The KFM Diversified Infrastructure and Logistics Fund became Cube Logistics in June 2010. Cube Bulk provides complete mine to market and mine to resupply solutions, offering mine road rail storage, port and ship services. Cube handles more than 85 million tonnes per annum of various bulk ores, concentrates, mineral sands, salt, coal and dangerous goods. They also deliver a range of tanker services from pneumatic operations for cement and lime through to bulk liquid tankers for fuel and sulfuric acid. Cube Ports is a major integrated port solutions provider in Australia with bulk and general handling facilities in over 40 Australian, New Zealand and Southeast Asian ports. They are the leader in the market in providing a purpose designed solutions for their customers. That includes handling containers, bulk automotive and general cargo. Additionally, it is a 50% joint venture partner with Patrick Corporation. Cube Logistics provides complete logistics services incorporating road and rail transport, warehousing and distribution, container, parks and related services into modal logistics hubs including rail terminals and global services incorporating procurement, freight forwarding, import and export services. Cube services can be combined as an integrated solution or tailored to meet individual client needs. Cube has a growing portfolio of property assets. Their interest lies in this asset that covers the full spectrum from owner, developer and landlord which is Beverage Intermodal Freight Terminal located in the east of Beverage, 40 kilometres north of the Melbourne Central Business District. Australian Amalgamated Terminals is a multi-user, open access port facility provider supporting the general stevedoring industry. The single largest shareholder in Cube Holdings is HSBC Custody Nominees Australia Limited with a capital holding of 27.64% followed by JP Morgan Nominees Australia PTY Limited that holds capital of 10.33%. Do you think Cube Holdings should be included in your investment journey? Please do let us know in the comments and subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to press the bell icon. I'm Sage reporting for Calkine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. Innovation today is crossing the bounds of industries to give way to a much more dynamic future. The spheres of innovation have empowered individuals as well as businesses to look beyond existing realms and opt for new age solutions. Be it highly effective marketing strategies and techniques, novel treatment for cancer, research and development of wellness products or innovating health through natural ingredients, the world is witnessing a paradigm shift when newfangled ways of living are replacing conventional concepts and ideas. In Kalkai Media's upcoming webinar, we're putting innovation into the spotlight. 
Join us live with prominent personalities from three innovative companies who double as Kalkine Media's reputed clients that are leading the innovation charge. On July 28, Kalkine Media will be joined by the executive chairman and CEO of Invian Limited, Thien Chu. We'll also be joined by the founder and CEO of Holistic Coltech, Dr. Rajin Manika, and the CEO of Corporality Global, Priya Mishra, as we take a closer look at some of their incredible products and the work their companies are doing. So if you're keen to see how some of our country's top thinkers are ushering in the new era of tech, healthcare, and more, then add it to your calendars. Calcar Media's InvestNest webinar on July 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. Welcome to another edition of Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage and today's guest is Mr. Simon Harrison, Operations Manager at AAPM Media. And business networking in clubs and associations can be highly beneficial to build up alliances, synergistic business ecosystems and mergers. But in the unprecedented times that we've seen with pandemic restrictions and geopolitical issues affecting the climate, sometimes these connections need to be done virtually. So for some background, AAPM Media is a private invitation only social media platform for London businesses to invigorate connectivity. And today's guest will share insights from his work in the space. So it should be an interesting show. Bringing you live today, we have Mr. Simon Harrison, Operations Manager at AAPM Media. Welcome to the show, Simon. It's great to be here, thank you. Simon, we're glad to have you with <laughs> us today. Could you firstly share your insights on the most optimum strategies to grow local businesses in the present market dynamics? Yeah, you're right what you said. We're, we're in unprecedented waters uh, with regard to business uh, growth. And so businesses need to be able to adapt to the challenging times. Uh, but in addition to that, what we really encourage clients to have is that firm foundation of perceived value for money and superior customer support. A lot of people are somewhat tired these days of uh, automated responses and so forth. And companies that can offer a tailored or a personal touch uh, to assist their clients, often finding just that small amount of percentage uh, superiority over their clients. If I might give an example, some years ago, um, I was talking with uh, perhaps the most famous business directory in the world, um, Yellow Pages, and uh, they were very reliant on their book distribution um, in order to generate business. But the internet had become the, the hot topic at the time. I mean, this is quite some years ago, and I was speaking to one of their consultants, and I said, why is Yellow Pages still reliant on books when they mostly get thrown out? And he said, well, we have a website, and it doesn't feature the direction, the trend is towards more digital and yet Yellow Pages was reliant on their books. Now, whilst Yellow Pages still retains a significant market share, they didn't move very quickly in this respect as far as we were concerned. And what that meant is that they allowed uh, their competitors to gain a, a greater market share. And so that teaches us that when we're in challenging or fluid times, we need to be able to adapt to those times quickly. But the core principle of caring for our clients, of being approachable and offering value for money for our services must be the foundation on which those changes need to be built. Exactly. Thank you for sharing that with us. And in these challenging times, you don't want to lose that quality of service that you aim to offer as a business, I suppose, as well. And also, you don't want to let competitiveness get nasty because sometimes you hear of people clicking on Google Ads so that their ads aren't reaching the, the proper clients and customers. So I suppose social networking in, a, in a, a platform like yours can allow for really positive business interactions. It sounds fantastic. And, and social media brings significant marketing prospects to local businesses. Could we talk about how local brands can optimise their social media reach, please? Yeah, I, we've seen a trend over the last year or so to move away from uh, perhaps in the past social media would employ high cost celebrities in order to promote their products and, and that does have value but there's been a trend towards more uh, personal um, interactions. Uh, for instance on YouTube, um, a lot of the personal bloggers and bloggers, they're, 
they're gaining a significant market share because what they're doing is they're speaking um, directly to their customers on a level that their customers can relate to. And that communication is something that's really been the trend in recent times. And so what we've seen is a rise in influencers and people that the audience um, can relate to. And that, that principle can extend to all businesses. What businesses need to do with their social media is be able to communicate effectively with clients. Um, it's not so much just a matter now of, of selling something. It's being able to speak to your customer on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So the challenge for businesses today is to be able to communicate with their customers or their customer base in such a way as that, that it reaches the heart of people to whom they're speaking, not just their logic or their purse strings. But what we want to do is we want to encourage businesses to use social media to actually motivate uh, people more. And the way to do that is to use examples or you know, to use figures in the social marketing campaign that are on the level of or can relate to those uh, that customers. That's so true and now we're seeing so much more alignment between customer experience as well as employee experience and engagement. So there's that synergy there as well and social media and building up narratives is, is so important to see the real life aspects of people gaining from one's business. So um, the ABBR Business Social is a private invitation only social media platform for London businesses. What is the mission of this platform? We started um, this social media for businesses around about a year ago and we've been experiencing about 20% growth per month um, consistently. What we've tried to do is build up um, a social media network. Although there are options such as LinkedIn and, and others that are currently on the market, uh, we've been trying to make it more of a, I guess, an informal uh, platform where businesses can not only post their updates, post their products and interact, but they can do so in a way that's perhaps a little bit more user friendly. Uh, we found it very effective uh, as a consistent growth month on month. And it seems every month we're uh, achieving new targets. And what we've tried to do is to keep that platform without cost. Uh, we recuperate expenses through advertising and so forth. Um, the clients do have an option to upgrade to a pro package, but what it does is it makes it a user-friendly, everyday social media platform for businesses. Um, when you mention it's invitation only, we do that only because obviously the internet is something that's often misused. Uh, for instance, uh, we get a lot of uh, perhaps less uh, credible uh, businesses trying to post on there, and we want to keep it because there's been a lot of focus lately on misuse of social media platforms, um, perhaps uh, people with agendas using social media platforms for their own benefit. So what we've tried to do is to keep the platform credible. Uh, and whilst that does sometimes reduce the amount of uh, participants in that platform, what it does is we're trying to establish the credibility and the uh, dignity of that platform for businesses to use so that they can feel safe but still communicate effectively. Yeah, so true. I mean, that is such a pertinent point, the disinformation on the internet that we're faced with and the noise. It's, it's really hard to sift through that um, chafe to find the pearls, basically. And we're having a really good discussion here, Simon. You're filling the time with so much vital information. Lastly, what are your goals at AAPM Media for 2022? I think keeping the goals fluid is, is key because, uh, for instance, Businesses, if they face another lockdown, for instance, um, their budgets, they hit significantly. Um, and to be able to cater to serve those businesses, we need to be fluid, we need to be able to adapt to the challenges. So we're working on the key core issues, which is providing an effective and cost effective to our platform. But we also want to offer uh, ways for businesses to be able to interact with their customers on a personal level. Um, because they're really customer service and value for money are what we believe are the key values for any business, whether it's digital or whether it's your bricks and mortar style of businesses. So we, we're focusing on those core issues. Uh, we're adapting our products according to the needs, according to the times. And we're trying to not be too rigid because we never know what the next 12 months will bring, but likely there will be challenges. So keep the foundation strong and rise to the challenges as they, as they are. 
Sounds great. All the best with that. And especially with the increased digitisation we've seen, it's great to hear that you're supporting businesses to stay relatable in the space and to build their brands in a relatable manner. Thank you so much for sharing your insights today, Simon. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And for the full recorded interview with Mr. Simon Harrison, please head to Calkine Media's YouTube channel. Until the next episode, keep watching Calkine TV for more of these live expert talks and market insights. Until the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. Challenger is an investment management firm focusing on providing Australians with financial security in retirement. Challenger operates three core investment businesses, a fiduciary funds management division, an Australian Prudential Regulation Authority and Regulate Life Division, as well as an Australian Prudential Regulation Authority regulated authorised deposit taking institution. Challenger Group is managed by CEO Nick Hamilton and is an ASX listed investment management firm managing $115 billion in assets. It provides a range of product solutions aimed at helping people during their retirement. And these solutions are based around Challenger's market leading annuities that pays a regular income for life or for a chosen investment term, providing a peace of mind in retirement. Challenger Lifetime Annuity Liquid Lifetime is a lifetime annuity that pays a regular income for life in return for a lump sum investment. It gives an additional layer of protection in retirement and can act as a safety net, giving you income for life, regardless of one's life expectancy. A Challenger Term Annuity is a secure investment that provides a guaranteed regular income for a fixed term on one's choosing, regardless of how share markets perform and gives flexible capital return options at maturity. The rate for a Challenger Term Annuity is fixed for the term of one's investment. Challenger Care Plus provides guaranteed monthly payments for the life of the investor, helping manage aged care costs and living expenses. Comment below if you believe Challenger Care Plus should be along your investment journey. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. This is Sage reporting for Calkine Media. Innovation today is crossing the bounds of industries to give way to a much more dynamic future. The spheres of innovation have empowered individuals as well as businesses to look beyond existing realms and opt for new age solutions. Be it highly effective marketing strategies and techniques, novel treatment for cancer, research and development of wellness products or innovating health through natural ingredients, the world is witnessing a paradigm shift when newfangled ways of living are replacing conventional concepts and ideas. In Kalkai Media's upcoming webinar, we're putting innovation into the spotlight. Join us live with prominent personalities from three innovative companies who double as Kalkai Media's reputed clients that are leading the innovation charge. On July 28, Kalkai Media will be joined by the Executive Chairman and CEO of Indian Limited, Thien Chu. We'll also be joined by the Founder and CEO of Holistic Coltech, Dr. Rajin Manaka, and the CEO of Corporality Global, Priya Mishra as we take a closer look at some of their incredible products and the work their companies are doing. So if you're keen to see how some of our country's top thinkers are ushering in the new era of tech, healthcare and more, then add it to your calendars. Calcar Media's InvestNest webinar on July 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Standard Time.
Hello, I'm Rachel Jones for Calkai Media. Welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. In this edition, I'll be chatting with Tracy Ho, Managing Director and Founder of Frame and Fame, a personal branding and executive coaching company. Welcome to our show, Tracy. Hello, Rachel. Thank you for having me today. Very interested to hear more about Frame and Fame. So, Tracy, how do you manage to improve clients' personal brand and also elevate their executive presence through your company? Thank you, Rachel. I would say personal branding, regardless you like it or not, you have a brand. Everybody has a brand. And I can share a little bit why I got inspired to start a personal branding firm. When I started, nobody said it would, um, you know, worth a business idea. But in fact, this is something that nobody talked about, right? In a corporate life, in your entrepreneurial life, uh, regardless in a public or private enterprise, you need to exert your presence to to be recognized. So then how we support executives, managers, or business owners? Now we have a, I would say, full suite of services from image to communications to their demeanor. We call it be seen, be heard, and be known. From image consulting to communication training, help them to present their ideas with clarity, confidence, and a compelling manner. To all the way a mindset shift, that is how coaching comes in. We work with these executives to build up the executive presence through you know how they would conduct themselves how they can become more culturally sensitive no matter being more empathetic leader or be more decisive leader at the end it's how they want to make their inference how they want to make an impact in the workplace and the industry it sounds fascinating so tracy at the moment what are your most in-demand services thank you rachel uh as you know, everybody got impacted by a certain degree by the COVID pandemic in the past one and a half or even two years. So, so then one of our signature services is we call it strategic brand building and LinkedIn revamp services. We sit down with you know communicate uh, executives, no matter in person, virtually, and then we hear you know the the ambition. We always start from a need. I always say when want to when you want to leverage personal branding, you want to have an idea where you want to be. And our role is support these people to rise to the next level. And then after we sit down with them, we hear their ambition, their personality. That is the core elements of personal branding. We always say that it's not a good use of your time to study how others build a brand because everybody is different. So we spend time with the individuals, listen to what they want to achieve. And then our job is to help them articulate and present the idea so then their audience can get it right away. We always say that you only have eight seconds or even less to leave an impression with your audience. So how can you grasp that chance online and in person? Then we, after we you know, share the narrative, we will bring to you know, the channels. Nowadays, most of our LinkedIn and half of them maybe also go to other social media networks like Instagram to them to be visualized as a brand. So how, in your opinion, Tracy, could you could personal branding fast track one's career? I mean, you mentioned LinkedIn there. How mm. important is it to, to build on your image for your career? Thank you, Rachel. Um, as I mentioned, you know, personal branding exists for, you know, ex as long as human history exists. But it has only become a new idea. It's still one of the, being considered as one of the uh, soft skills to know and master in the 21st century. How can personal branding help with your career growth? It comprises, comprises with, you know, as I mentioned, the mindset shift. It starts from your mind. If you do not have an idea how to strategize your career, it will not be easy to move on. So we always say the journey starts from yourself. Are you ready? Then do you know how and when and what to say to assert your presence? It comes with conciseness as well as consistency. Very often we see people that, you know, maybe just today they want to be seen as a leader, but tomorrow in, in front of any crisis or, or hiccups, then they change. 
So that's why consistency matters. After you work on your mindset, it's time to work on your demeanor. Nowadays, we work in a multicultural environment. So a big part of our work is to work with these executives and managers and business owners to understand cultural differences, be sensitive to it, so then you can lead multi-generation and multi-nationalities in the same workplace. And to answer, you know, the next to, uh, point of your question is how can these personal branding tools to upscale your career? My question is, have you ever found difficult to be uh, recognized? Nowadays, we are no longer graduates that we compete by GPA, right? We compete by our achievements, but not only our achievements, it's how your seniors, how your clients, how investors perceive the thing you do. And that is where personal branding helps. Now, you do have some training workshops offered by your company. What can you tell me about those? Thank you, Rachel. Um, we have, as I mentioned, we have a suite of services. Um, we still package under three tier. The first tier is to be seen in how you want to be seen as the leaders. We have um, image consulting workshops. And then we also have web development. You know, we looked at your layout, your brand identities, uh, for example, logos, um, name cards, and nowadays even your portraits. So we work with individuals in group setting or individual settings to uh, prepare them to provide some their future. Then the second tier is the most demanded training of ours. It's communication. Speaking of communication, it involves a range of topics. Uh, one of the high demand would be multicultural communications in the workplace. The second would be international business etiquette. Again, etiquette and uh, image, they are topics that people expect you to know. But to be honest, some leaders or managers, they would need to, for example, review how they're doing and then they discuss in a very safe environment what their vulnerabilities are. So this could be done in a training uh, platform. And then we also have the bread and butter, including, for example, um, storytelling, presentation as medium Q&A type of trainings. Then the highest level, we call it online presence, right? How you exert your presence online through social media, how to strategize, optimize, and make the best use of your LinkedIn, on your social media, or even your search engine to be found as the person you want to be seen. Then the last one will be the executive presence. I think we, we are happy that now we find we, we really own the space on personal branding and executive presence here. That um, you, when you think about personal branding, you come to us. Uh, we work with people in a group setting from talking about creating your story and visualize your ideas. And then in a group setting, we share and exchange ideas, how that perception being perceived live. So that will be very, very powerful for whoever participate in these workshops. And Tracy, what are your near-term goals at Frame and Fame? Uh, it's uh, I learned to when I start my business. I always say it's like raising a baby. Okay, of course, if you raise a baby, you want it to grow happily and healthily. Same as a business. At this stage, um, we. For the past two years or so, you know, we got impacts, of course, in certain extent by COVID. So then we spent um, time to revamp our brands, we well, revamp our services. So now we got some fruits. We got you know uh, uh, demands coming again. It's very very encouraging. The next step is we want to you know strengthen our online offering to work with people across the border. So then we don't need to be bound by any geographies um, the constraint. And the second day is to include, uh, we want to work more with corporates. Individuals are our key clients for now since the past you know, five years or so. But nowadays we see more demand from companies. Interestingly, when we talk about executive presence, many companies, no matter they are regional size or global size, they realize some of the, for example, second tier or even third tier leaders need to change the mindset specifically after COVID. You want to relate by being a human instead of by assigning a task. So we see there's a potential there for us to, you know, uh, get some low hanging fruits. It's been fabulous to chat to you today, Tracy. Thank you so much for all your information you've given us there. Thank you, Rachel. It's my pleasure.
Thank you very much. And that's Tracy Ho, founder and managing director of Frame and Fame Personal Branding. And if you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, Kalkai Media. So make sure to subscribe. I'm Rachel reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. Britain's energy watchdog Ofgem has proposed a new plan to improve the financial health of the operating energy suppliers. Last year, over 30 energy suppliers in the UK stopped their operations due to a sharp rise in wholesale energy prices, which triggered widespread losses. The new move is expected to save a number of energy companies from going bust and protect consumer credit balance if a certain company does fail. It would also prevent energy suppliers from charging high direct debit payments and allow firms to have sufficient control over key assets. The measures announced are intended to improve the financial health of energy suppliers to overcome the sharp surge in wholesale energy prices amidst record high inflation, the Ukraine crisis and also the cost of living crisis. Ofgem raised the energy price cap by 54% in April to £1,971 per year. Last month, it stated there will be a further hike by £800 to about £2,800 in October, which might take the inflation above 11% in the final quarter of the year. These announcements have the potential to impact plenty of suppliers, but let's focus on three of them for now, beginning with Centrica. Shares of Centrica, an international energy services and solutions company, were up by about 0.47% on June 20, trading at GBX 77.8. The company holds a market capitalisation of £4.57 billion as of 20th of June. The performance of the FTSE 250 index constituent has appreciated over the past year, with a one-year return as of 20th of June standing at 52.47%. Drax Group the shares of the power generation company Drax Group were up by 3.24% on the 20th of June 2022 and were trading at GBX 621.5. The company holds a market capitalisation of £2.41 billion as of the 20th of June. 
The performance of the FTSE 250 index constituent has appreciated over the past year, with a one-year return as of the 20th of June, standing at 44.53%. And lastly, SSE PLC. The shares of electricity network company SSE were up by 1.1% on the 20th of June 2022 and were trading at GBX 1605. The company holds a market cap of £16.94 billion as of June 20. And the performance of the FTSE 100 index constituent has appreciated over the past year with a one year return as of June 20 standing at 5.11%. So what are your thoughts on the new energy regulation plans in Britain? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to like and share the video. For more content, subscribe to the channel and press that bell icon. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. Welcome to a very special edition of Expert Talks by Calcane TV. I'm Sage. Today's guest is Mr. Charlie Bresler, PhD, the co-founder of Peter Singer's Foundation, The Life You Can Save. And Peter Singer's been on a, an Australian national tour uh, this month, so it's a very special time to connect with this organisation. And Charlie today will share his insights about effective altruism during the times of the pandemic, the gap between the rich and the poor has gotten bigger. With many billionaires increasing their wealth, global poverty is expected to only be exacerbated by the current economic conditions. And recently you may have heard about 30-year-old billionaire Sam Bankman-Fried pledging to give away a large sum of his money. This is for the cause of effective altruism. So I'm keen to find out more. Excited to bring you live today, Mr. Charlie Bresler, PhD co-founder of The Life You Can Save. Welcome to the show, Charlie. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor. Yes, I'm so keen to find out more about this great cause. Could you share with us the inspiration behind The Life You Can Save to begin with? Well, the personal inspiration for me came actually in a weird way. I was on a holiday with my family in Hawaii in 2012 and I happened to pick up a book called Practical Ethics by Peter Singer. And I liked it a lot. I was I found it interesting. And so I decided to go on and read another book which was by Peter called The Life You Can Save. And I would say that a light bulb went off for me. Not so much that the idea in the book, which is that we have the opportunity to help other people, particularly in the developing world where a dollar goes the furthest. But the light bulb for me was more like do something about it, Charlie. You've been thinking about doing this your whole life. You've raised a family. You've become a business leader. You were a tennis pro. You did all kinds of things, but you really haven't done much to help other people. So I found Peter's book inspiring. And then the other thing within the book that really got to me was a thought experiment called The Girl in the Pond. Is it okay if I share that with people? Of course. So the girl in the pond, Peter posits that you're walking by a pond wearing an expensive suit of clothes and you are late for a meeting, but you see this girl drowning in this shallow pond. And the question he poses for all of us is, would you drop, jump in and save the girl? And of course, Peter answers the question for all of us and says, of course, we jump in and save the girl. But then he posits something even more difficult for people, which is that there are 5.3 million children dying every year of largely preventable illnesses, illnesses that people would not die of in Australia or America. Children under five would not die of these illnesses or even contract them. But people, these children are dying. But we can do something about that. So in a sense, these 5.3 million children are very much like that girl in the pond but usually we just keep walking metaphorically and go on to our meeting and don't do much about it. So those were the inspirations for me to reach out to Peter, who I'd never met before, and say, hey, let's start a proper organization um, in the United States and Australia and eventually globally 
and try to get more and more people inspired to give in a highly cost-effective, impactful way. And that was really the beginning for me. And that was nine years ago, really. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I think a lot of people maybe would like to do something about it, but just feel they don't have the resources to help in a substantial way. Um, but I'd love to find out more about how your organization can provide infrastructure to help these people uh, shortly. Global poverty has increased, as we mentioned before, during these pandemic times. Do you think it's in the government's place to be doing more to support the poor? I do think it's in the government's place to be doing more. Um, oddly enough, both Australia and America, my, the country I live in, are close to the bottom of wealthy countries in terms of their, in, their foreign aid as a percentage of gross net domestic product. The United States looks good on paper because they have such a large gross domestic product that they give the most money, but it's still a very small percentage compared to other countries. Um, and so I think there's a lot more that can be done. And about only 2% of the aid that is given in foreign aid goes to income support. Uh, the, most give, the most goes to infrastructure and other factors in various countries. And for, quite frankly, often serves political ends rather than poverty alleviation, although the two sometimes coincide quite well, not enough. And so I do think it's the government's place. But I also think there's a role for individual and foundation philanthropy to join in and do a fair share. For example, in the United States, the country I'm most familiar with, we have about $300 billion plus dollars a year that are given by individuals. But only 6% of that money is given internationally where a dollar goes the furthest and can help people quite far away. And, uh, but still the people who are in many ways uh, in the greatest need, despite the fact that both in Australia and America, there are people in tremendous need, but it often costs a lot more money to help those people than it does in countries in Sub-Saharan Africa or South Asia. So I think both private philanthropy, and I mean people who are giving $2 to buy an insecticide treated bed net and governments that can give uh, billions of dollars. I think there's a role for both uh, government, private uh, donations, as well as for industry to join in. Yes, I, I hear what you say. I, I think the minimum wage in America is about nine or ten US dollars, which is really quite low. In, in Australia, it's closer to twenty dollars per hour. Um, so it's a little bit higher, but not much different. And there's not a lot you can do with that sort of income through the week. You're really just making ends meet. Um, thank you for your insights there, Charlie. Do you think it's possible to really have a world without hunger and poverty where everyone earns the same amount of money and has a decent standard of living. What do you think that world would look like? I think it is absolutely possible to have a world where there's no hunger and no poverty. What we're facing now in the Ukraine and in Yemen are, uh, I would say, politically created uh, famines and uh, disasters. But, and often it's very difficult to stop that from happening. But in many, many countries around the world where there's poverty, that poverty could be alleviated. And the hope would be that we would start with the countries that where we can alleviate poverty uh, in South uh, Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa. And we also try to do what we can to help countries where it's much more difficult to do that for political or military reasons like the Ukraine or Yemen or Afghanistan. But I think it is possible to have a world like that. And I would refer people to a book by the Nobel Prize winning uh, economist Am Amitriya Sen called Development is Freedom, uh, in which he argues that, for example, famines have largely been of human beings making and that we had the capacity during these famines to feed people. Uh, that is not to say that, for example, now with wheat being uh, tremendously impacted in the Ukraine, that we could necessarily change that situation. But yes, I think there could be a world without hunger or poverty. Do I think there could be a world where everyone makes the same amount of money and has access to the same material lifestyle? I think that world is utopian. And even though maybe in my youth I used to dream about a world like that, I no longer think that is the goal. 
I think the goal is to have a world where people and non-human animals are alleviated from unnecessary suffering. And I think that is the primary goal. I think people should always think about a world where people share some of the same material wealth, but I don't think that is what the goal is right now. True, true. Thank you so much. And it's kind of um, sacrilegious that governments and some companies like McDonald's can spend enormous amounts of money on advertising and government spending on defense instead of really helping people in need. There are so many parts of the world that need support. How can people find out where to start? Does your foundation offer any infrastructure to allow people to begin their journey in effective altruism? That really is our goal. Our motto is to make smart giving simple. And so we have two different mechanisms for doing that. First of all, we have create, we have bought back the rights to this book. I'm going to hold it up. It's Peter's book, the one that inspired me, called The Life You Can Save. And this book and all of what Peter is writing there are available as an ebook or audio book on our website, thelifeyoucansave.org. And I, I encourage people to read the book and to really absorb Peter's message. The other thing we do, which may be much simpler for people, is that we've created a website on the lifeyoucansave.org. And on that website, we've curated approximately 25 highly effective nonprofits where if you give the money to that nonprofit through the website or directly to the nonprofit, you can get, in most cases, tax deductions. And you know, most importantly, that the money will reach the recipients. It won't be taken by some corrupt dictator or some administrator uh, in some faraway country. These, co these charities have been vetted very carefully by a number of different sources to make sure that the money you give will do things like uh, buy a bed net uh, for someone who might otherwise get malaria, deliver a life-saving operation to a woman who otherwise would be crippled uh, post childbirth, um, restore people's sight like the Fred Hollows Foundation in Australia does for as little as $50, particularly children um, who have congenital cataracts. So when you look through our website, thelifeyoucansave.org, you find the opportunity that I was excited about uh, nine years ago when Diana, my wife, and I said, my gosh, this is about time we use some of our privilege. Uh, both in terms of our time, but also in terms of our financial resources to help other people. And no, this organization has been built on the desire to help other people have that opportunity. I like to say that you can save more lives than Superman or Batman, and you can do it from the comfort of your own living room. That is not to say you can solve all the world's problems or the ones that are particularly in front of us in uh, Ukraine, Yemen, Afghanistan, but it is to say that if you focus on what you can do, um, you can feel like you're not powerless in this world. That is a very encouraging statement there. Thank you so much, Charlie. But yes, I mean, can, the world almost can't afford its own problems in some ways. I mean, Australia's got a national deficit of close to $90 million, I think, and or even more. Amazon's doing a lot in Australia to help people with housing, which is great to hear. And the exchange rate, when you give in Australian or US dollars to these emerging economies, it, it actually doubles or even triples. So when you see the money growing and able to help these people so much, it must be such a great feeling. It is, it's really amazing that you can restore a child's sight, one child for $50, a child that otherwise would go blind throughout their entire life, where in order to train a guide dog in Australia or the United States to assist a blind person, which is a very important thing to do, it costs thousands and thousands of dollars, and yet for $50, we can restore someone's sight. It's quite uh, inspiring. Thank you. Now, we have to round up the discussion now. I understand you've got quite a busy day ahead. Could you tell us a little more about the programs offered? You've just mentioned them now, but if someone was to jump on your website and if the first thing they're to look at, would you recommend them to start somewhere? Well, on our homepage, they, you can find all the causes that we really help with.
Hello, I'm Rachel Jones. Thanks for tuning in to Galkind TV for the Daily Crypto Catch. Now, a new survey has revealed that the majority of respondents believe that Bitcoin could fall to 10,000 US dollars. The survey by Bloomberg Markets Live says 60% of respondents believe Bitcoin is more likely to fall to $10,000 than it is to rise to $30,000. On the other hand, 40% of respondents believe the opposite and that Bitcoin's next move will be up to 30,000 US dollars. Now the survey which collected responses from 950 Bloomberg Live users found that ordinary retail investors were more skeptical towards cryptocurrency than institutions. The survey also revealed 20% of respondents believe crypto assets are completely worthless. Meanwhile, 28% of respondents believe that crypto is the future of finance. Most respondents said that Bitcoin and Ethereum are the two best tokens to hold on to. A significant share of respondents also believe that central bank digital currencies will play a key role in the digital asset ecosystem. Moving on now to market news and Bitcoin dropped a further 5% from yesterday and was recently trading at 19,871 US dollars. Meanwhile, Ethereum also took a dive from yesterday, losing a further 7% and was recently trading at just above 1,000 US dollars. As for today's winners and losers, our Weave token gained 4.91% in the last 24 hours. Meanwhile, Loopring grew around 1.6% in the same period. On the losing side, Steppen token dropped 11.61% overnight, while Uniswap token fell 10.96%. All right, that's it for this edition of The Daily Crypto Catch. Stay tuned to Calkine TV for the latest market updates, business news and exclusive interviews. I'm Rachel. Thanks for joining me. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the... Crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. Innovation today is crossing the bounds of industries to give way to a much more dynamic future. The spheres of innovation have empowered individuals as well as businesses to look beyond existing realms and opt for new age solutions. Be it highly effective marketing strategies and techniques, novel treatment for cancer, research and development of wellness products or innovating health through natural ingredients, the world is witnessing a paradigm shift when newfangled ways of living are replacing conventional concepts and ideas. In Kalkai Media's upcoming webinar, we're putting innovation into the spotlight. Join us live with prominent personalities from three innovative companies who double as Kalkai Media's reputed clients that are leading the innovation charge. On July 28, Kalkai Media will be joined by the executive chairman and CEO of Invian Limited, Thien Chu. We'll also be joined by the founder and CEO of Holistic Coltec, Dr. Rajin Manaka, and the CEO of Corporality Global, Priya Mishra, as we take a closer look at some of their incredible products and the work their companies are doing. So if you're keen to see how some of our country's top thinkers are ushering in the new era of tech, healthcare, and more, then add it to your calendars. 
Kaukau Media's InvestNest webinar on July 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. UK house prices have hit a record high level in June, but they're expected to decline over the coming months amid the rising interest rates and the spiralling cost of living crisis. So as the UK housing market cools down, investors can keep an eye on real estate stocks offering good returns. Let's take a look at three. The first one is BMO Commercial Property Trust. On a year-to-date basis, the FTSE 250 listed company has given its shareholders a return of over 11% while its one-year return stands at around 32%. The market cap of BMO stands at £841 million. Another stock is AEW UK REIT. On a year-to-date basis, the company has given its shareholders a return of 5.4%, while its one-year return stands at 26%. The current market cap of AEW UK stands at £187 million. And then there is Supermarket Income REIT. On a year-to-date basis, the company has given its shareholders a return of 5.9%, while its one-year return stands at 4.86. The current market cap of Supermarket Income is £1.6 billion. Now they're up to speed, hit that bell icon to stay updated and boost your financial IQ. I'm Holly Shields for Calcai Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Buy now, pay later, or BNPL for short. Companies are on the brink as bad debts amid the rising interest rates are causing havoc for the sector. On Monday, Reserve Bank of Australia Governor Philip Lowe said it is a challenging time in the global economy. Most countries, including the United States and Australia, have been experiencing the highest rates of inflation for decades. The tragic events in Ukraine have led to sharp increases in food and energy prices. And moreover, globally interest rates are rising from the record lows during the coronavirus pandemic stimulus activity. And lo and behold, inflation is no longer transitory. Lowe also predicted that interest rates would increase by no more than 50 basis points in July. Many industries are facing the brunt, but one industry in the doldrums is the buy now, pay later, or BNPL sector. It is experiencing a perfect storm of escalating interest rates, bad debts, a situated market and impending regulation. The buy now and pay later option gained traction quickly in the economy due to cheap borrowing costs and high consumer demand. As millennials and members of Generation Z opted for low interest payment plans, the sector expanded exponentially. And although BNPL has been fantastic for many merchants, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, market analysts believe the sector's heyday is past. Let's look at what problems are on the horizon for BNPL companies. Apparently, two major concerns confront BNPL lenders. Consumers would find inflation too severe to bear. 
leading them to cut back on purchases of goods and services, resulting in fewer lending chances for BNPL companies. And secondly, it can become more difficult to finance loans if interest rates keep rising as Australia's central bank and the central banking system of the United States of America have indicated. Afterpay reported a loss after tax of $159.4 million for the year ended 30th June 2021, compared to the loss after tax of just $22.9 million in 2020. Zips reported loss before tax stands at $724 million compared to $20.6 million in the year period. Experts have suggested that bad debts were rising due to the strain on household budgets. Zipco was trading at $0.47, cents, down by 10.48%. Sizzle was trading at 26 cents, down by 7.02%, and Hum Group was trading at 50 cents, down by 3.81%. This is current on June 22, 2022. In the current market scenario, it'll be interesting to see how these stocks combat the headwinds they might face with rising interest rates. Thank you for joining us on the report. If you do like the information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below, subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, you'll be notified every time Kalkine releases a new video. But for more articles, head to the website kalkinemedia.com. My name's Sage for Kalkine Media. Crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. Digital clothing is projected to be a $50 billion industry by 2026 and Meta is gearing up to be a major player already. The tech giant has just launched the Meta Avatars store, a design and clothing store for the virtual avatars in the metaverse. Zuckerberg made the appearance on Instagram Live to make the announcement alongside Instagram's Vice President of Fashion Partnerships, Eva Chen. According to TechCrunch, the stores will soon be opening in different markets in the UK, Canada, Mexico and Thailand, as well as other countries. They'll feature digital designs created by luxury brands like Belgencia, Prada and Tom Brown, and they'll also be available for Metis avatars on Facebook, Instagram and Messenger. The pricing has not yet been revealed, although free clothing for digital avatars will continue to remain available for Metaverse users. Digital wearables have taken the fashion world by storm, with major and independent designers coming out with their own reality-defying products. The concept is popular for being a sustainable solution to fast fashion, reducing time to market and offering endless possibilities with creativity. Although the tech is not fully there yet. Since clothes are custom fitted to a client's photo, the process of digitally dressing can actually take a few hours and considering the current limitations of AI and 3D modeling software. What's more, these items on offer at the moment can get pretty expensive, and some consumers still aren't willing to pay what they would for physical clothing. Would you be willing to spend $40 on a digital t-shirt? Let us know in the comments and hit that bell icon to stay updated. I'm Holly Shields for Metaverse. Innovation today is crossing the bounds of industries to give way to a much more dynamic future. The spheres of innovation have empowered individuals as well as businesses to look beyond existing realms and opt for new age solutions. Be it highly effective marketing strategies and techniques, novel treatment for cancer, research and development of wellness products or innovating health through natural ingredients, the world is witnessing a paradigm shift when newfangled ways of living are replacing conventional concepts and ideas. In Kalkai Media's upcoming webinar, we're putting innovation into the spotlight. 
Join us live with prominent personalities from three innovative companies who double as Kalkine Media's reputed clients that are leading the innovation charge. On July 28, Kalkine Media will be joined by the executive chairman and CEO of Invian Limited, Thien Chu. We'll also be joined by the founder and CEO of Holistic Coltec, Dr. Rajin Manika, and the CEO of Corporality Global, Priya Mishra as we take a closer look at some of their incredible products and the work that companies are doing. So if you're keen to see how some of our country's top thinkers are ushering in the new era of tech, healthcare and more, then add it to your calendars. Calcar Media's InvestNest webinar on July 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Millions wiped off Trevor Lawrence's crypto portfolio. What went wrong? Are cryptocurrencies the biggest wealth creators in the contemporary world? There might still be a lot of crypto enthusiasts that might say yes. And these backers of digital currency are probably the ones who bought their assets at low prices and liquidated them to book profit at an opportune time. But for many, cryptos might also have been a huge wealth destroyer. The latest in the list of crypto backers that have lost substantial amounts of money in the wake of the ongoing meltdown is NFL star Trevor Lawrence. Let's explore in this video. Please subscribe to the channel. My name's Sage for Calkine Media. So what's the buzz about Trevor Lawrence's crypto investments? The cryptocurrency investment by Trevor Lawrence, a top NFL draft pick player of the year had made headlines in early May 2021 and according to reports when quarterback Lawrence signed a contract with Jacksonville Jaguars last year his entire signing bonus was parked in crypto assets. He was said to have joined forces with an exchange Blockfolio that converted the bonus into assets including Bitcoin, Ether and Solana. Reportedly, bonus money worth 24 million US dollars was converted into cryptos. Before him, a few other NFL players like Sean Culkin were also reported to have chosen to get paid in Bitcoin or other cryptos. Trevor Lawrence's crypto losses. It is easily understandable that any investment in Bitcoin in May last year may have yielded massive losses looking at Bitcoin's current price. As per reports, Lawrence's crypto portfolio is down more than 60%. Millions of dollars have been wiped out in a matter of a year, which has become the talk of the town. And since Lawrence's investment using the Blockfolio platform made big news, the losses reported by analysts are also hitting the headlines. There is, however, no official statement yet from Lawrence. The sum of money that was converted into cryptos last year is also just an estimate. Lessons for crypto fans. Crypto prices can swing in any direction. Last year, all three cryptos that were reported to have made Lawrence's portfolio grow in value. Solana was one of the best performing among thousands of assets in the cryptoverse, for example, last year. But this year has been fraught with extreme negative forces, which have resulted in heavy losses. Bitcoin, Ethereum and Solana have all lost at least half of their value since the beginning of 2022. And the crypto lesson here is that enthusiasts that liquidate their assets at the opportune time can emerge unscathed. So how the hold on for dear life or hodl sentiment will survive in the longer horizon is a wait and watch game. The bottom line. NFL quarterback Trevor Lawrence's reported crypto losses might add to the fears that are already prevailing in the crypto market. And that said, Bitcoin has currently stabilized at close to 20,000 US dollars after having dropped to under 18,000 US dollars just a few days back. 
Thank you for joining us on this report and if you do like the information please let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below, subscribe to the channel, press that bell icon, you'll be notified of the most recent videos from Calkine. However, for more articles like this do head to the website, it's calkinemedia.com. This is Sage for Calkine Media. Crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. Hello, great to have your company. I'm James Preston for Kalkine Media and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. In this edition, I'll be shining a light on NDIS loan experts and SMS F loan experts. And the best way to do that is to sit down with the founder and managing director, Yannick Yeko. Yannick, thanks so much for joining me today. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Now, Yannick, first and foremost, what exactly is it that your company does? Okay. Yeah, we, um, we're mortgage brokers. We specialize in assisting investors that want to leverage real estate um, investment within their self-managed super funds. We also support investors that are looking at investing into NDIS um, housing. These are our two niches. Now, for those of us who aren't exactly across what NDIS housing is, could you give us a brief little explanation? Absolutely. Um, NDIS, so that's the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Within that scheme, which is funding all the needs for disabled people in Australia, there is a sub-branch which is called SDA, Specialised Disability Accommodation. And the government is trying to incentivize investors to um, produce new housing, which is suitable for disabled people. When you do do that within the scheme, the government is offering very generous incentives to investors um, in terms of uh, an ongoing payment over a 20 years period. Now, I can't imagine the, uh, the percentage of those living with a disability in Australia is particularly high. So exactly how big is this segment? Is it sizable enough that it, it is something we can invest in and see some sort of return? Absolutely. So you, you have a crowd of um, hundreds of thousands of people, which are, um, if not millions, that are funded through the NDIS for various levels of disability. Hmm. Within that cohort of people who need assistance with their disability, there's about 7% of them have been approved for housing support, which means that they can unlock the government payment for investors. And yeah, these people desperately need some, some suitable accommodation. It's quite a, quite a terrible situation and socially. Well, look, it's, it's good they've at least got some level of support there. That is a very important thing, obviously. Now, uh, for Aussies more broadly, though, I think a lot of us are concerned with the current cost of living and also the obvious housing affordability crisis, which has really gone through the roof in the past two years with the pandemic. Uh, there is, of course, another option, that is NDIS investment in properties. Is, is, do you see that as a good way to try and, I suppose, alleviate the current position so many Aussies are facing where they feel priced out of the housing market? Uh, absolutely, and for a number of reasons. So, look, we can touch on the, the, the ethical or the social benefits, and that's one thing. But from an investor perspective, what, the benefit of NDIS investing, it's very high yield. So it's not so much focused on growth, even though you can experience it on the property. But it's the yield that's driving people there. So you can get a, a real cash flow boost through such an investment, which can then you can then use that to alleviate the, the increase in cost of livings and, and whatnot. The great thing with the NDIS payments is that they are automatically indexed. So they're very much inflation proof in the sense that if inflation goes up and inflation goes through the roof, so will the payments that you receive from your, your NDIS property. Well, it's an interesting avenue as well because, I mean, obviously these properties are designed to have disabled people living within them, but uh, are there any sort of, I suppose, loopholes or hurdles that people have to jump through who don't have a disability who might be looking to invest in them because obviously you know the end goal is to is to put someone in there with a disability so 
someone like myself who hasn't got one, I couldn't, for example, go and live there, but I can still purchase it. How easy is that process, though? Very much so. Look, it, it, is, it is a process, as with all government sort of um, initiatives, there's usually a bit of red tape and, and et cetera. But essentially, the scheme is designed for people who are not disabled and are producing properties for people who are disabled. So it's very much geared toward investors and mm. non-disabled people, potentially. The, the key here is that in order to be accredited in the scheme and deliver the payments that we've been referring to, a property needs to meet certain standards and, and fit within a frame that has been set in terms of what we want to see for disabled people to live in. So the key is in the design and the delivery of the, the property that you want to get in the scheme and make sure that it passes the test. Once the property is passing the test, it's it, everything else falls in place fairly straightforwardly. It's it's not rocket science. It's, it's very mm -hmm. achievable. It's very good because my mathematics is not strong, that is for sure. Um, Yannick, do you think we'll see a reprieve with the rising cost of housing in your time soon or is it still set to go up for a little while yet? No, in my view, the, the plateau has been, the, the peak has been already achieved and passed. I think there was uh, an article in the AFR this morning or yesterday saying that about 40% of suburbs in Sydney last month went down in value and we, we certainly have a sense from the ground up that this is what's happening. So I expect with interest rate rising um, in the near future, probably June, we're gonna to start to see a decline in value. The, the cycle has turned and we, we're entering a downward um, spiral as far as I can tell. So I think the, the correction is starting and the, the crazy increases are certainly over. Um, most people would be um, doing well if they, they were planning for a decrease in housing value over the next 12 to 24 months. That seems mm. extremely likely. In, in terms of that correction, obviously we've seen it just absolutely skyrocket. Some places have seen close to, I think, 150% increase, which is just ridiculous Crazy. stuff. Obviously, wages have not gone up at the same rate. People's savings, especially young people who are often found themselves out of work over the past two years, they're really struggling with this. Whilst that correction is coming, is it going to be enough to actually, I guess, fix the issues of the last couple of years? No, no. So you, you, you're very right. I mean, the, the expectation at the moment, I think, from most um, pundits is that every time interest rates going to go up by 1%, um, the, the market is likely to drop by 7%. <laughs> We're expecting a 2 to 3% increase in interest rates. So you're looking at 14, 14 to 21% maybe drop in the market. Obviously, this is a bit of crystal ball um, material, as we, we never know for sure. But you know, a correction around the the, vic the vicinity of 15% seems very likely. But that's only taking us back, you know, 12 months back in time where, where yeah. housing was already a challenge. So no, it's not gonna it's not gonna fix it, especially understanding that mortgage costs are going to go up. So even though the purchase price is going to be lower, it's still gonna cost you potentially more to maintain your mortgage. So no, it, it will not fix the issue. Well, Yannick, I know you're not in charge of policy, not in government at this point in time, but is there something you could see being an approach legislatively that could potentially lift things a little bit? Obviously, the budget has just been released. Was there anything in there that you thought, mm, that could do a little bit of something for people? No, no not, not really, to, to be honest. I think from a legislative viewpoint, the, the only thing that's really going to fix the problem structurally is to increase supply we, we know it's it's the basic of economics that if we increase supply the, the price is going to go down at the moment there's a lot of uh, hurdles for developers and people who want to bring supply to the market um, to to do that there, there are costs and there's a lot of red tape and there, there's a lot of authorities to deal with from council to state to federal so i think if there was anything that could be done to really alleviate what's going on here that would be um, to, to increase supply to streamline the approval process for the the whole industry that's trying to bring supply to the market and allow them to work more efficiently and, and faster to, to bring supply to the market. I, I think this is the only long-term sustainable answer mm. to that, the pressure on the cost of living. Um, there, there are some budget initiatives that could be taken to encourage people to move away from the city centres where housing is more affordable and that's probably more in terms of infrastructure and maybe incentivizing some areas with some tax benefits. In other countries, you know, they, they might define an economic zone where you pay less tax and, and you've got incentive from the government for companies to move so that we can de-engorge city centers where the pressure is, is the, the, the most intense on housing um, and move people around a bit more when it's more affordable. But yes, supply would have to be the key the, if there was one. 
That's a good, it's a good point you raised there as well. I mean, one thing I would strongly advocate is for some sort of bullet rail system, which we've seen, you know, work to great effect in other countries. Uh, one thing I always look at is, for example, you know, someone could live in Goulburn where the average house price is about $350,000 and all of a sudden you're there in the city within 40 minutes. It would just be a game changer. I, I, absolutely. I think decent tax incentive for companies and people to move would, would work a trade. It's, it's certainly worked overseas and they, they, you know, they've got different names, special economic zone, whatever the case is, but they essentially insular pockets where the rules are slightly different for businesses and individuals to incentivize them to move. It might be a three, five years, whatever time frame incentive. Once people are there, once businesses are there, they, they're unlikely to move back. Um, so that, along with some infrastructure like the one that you mentioned, I think could have a real impact. But uh, I, I haven't heard anything like that in the pipeline um, quite yet. No, nah, I don't think we will anytime soon, unfortunately, either. Uh, let's change focus just a little bit here. Now, self-managed super funds are gaining significant traction across Australia, although the pandemic has caused a little bit of disruption in that sector. With that in mind, how should Aussies approach self-managed super funds moving forward? Yeah, look, I think self-managed super for the right people can still be a, an absolutely great vehicle to, to prepare for retirement. I think more than ever in, in the volatile environment that we're in, the key is for people, A, to educate themselves, but also to seek advice, which is something which Aussies are not always prone to do. There's a kind of do it your own feeling out there, which is prevalent. And sometimes the value in advice is not entirely perceived by the general public. Um, I, I, the most successful investors I see and, and very sophisticated one are still and predominantly using advice and, and they have a cohort of people helping them, which is very easy to, to do. It's just that a lot of people don't do it. I'd say advice, advice, advice. There's been a lot of change in the environment, um, in the investment environment that you've mentioned, but also the regulatory environment for superannuation in general and for SMSF in particular. And, and staying abreast of those changes, as well as getting the right advice for investment, would have to be the way to go. Mm. Well, look, security and protection of self-managed super funds are also a very critical issue, especially with the, uh, the event of big data and just some of the things that we've seen over the past couple of years, whether it be, um, you know, vaccine applications, things like that. People seem to be a lot more concerned about making sure data is private. So how would you say would be the best way that self-managed super fund assets are basically secured in the most favourable conditions to prevent any leaks, prevent any data spillage? Yeah, look, uh, uh, this is slightly out of scope in terms of expertise for myself, but certainly from, from where we see it as a business. And I think, again, once you've got that, that sort of assets on the line and, and that are potentially going to be targeted by, by criminals, um, best practice mm in terms of online behavior and, and IT sort of setup is ideal. And I don't mean to repeat myself too much, but again, this is something that for most Aussies, for most people out there, this is not what we do every day. I would say spend spend the money to, to get the advice, to get the software, to get everything you need to be, um, to, to be right at the top of where you can be to protect your, your, yourself. So um, it, it falls in the same category as what we've discussed before, as far as I can tell. You want to make sure you've got good people in your team that can put you in the best possible place to make the most out of the opportunity. Absolutely. Look, there are certain things you can skimp on. It might be like a dodgy lunch, but not when it comes to your security, that is for sure. Now, yep. uh, look, we've talked a little bit about NDIS and also self-managed super funds more broadly, but let's hammer in on your business now. What exactly can you help within both of those scenarios. Uh, yeah. How can people start to maximize their income, maximize their investments and get the most out of a super fund? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Look, what we do um, and our primary are income producing activities, mortgage broking, and we, we organize the specialized loans that go with both of those uh, niches, that is NDIS and SMSF. And, and that's, that's what we do primarily. However, what we find ourselves doing a lot, which is a secondary type service or activity and it, it's not something we, we we make money from but it's very helpful for investors that we coordinate so people will come to us and say hey i've heard of you i want to invest in ndis how do i do it hmm. and what we can help investors do is we, we let them leverage our networks over the years we've built a network of people who are very good at the different bits and pieces that are involved in being successful either in ndis or smsf and we help coordinate the efforts. So we say, well, you know, the person you need to speak to in terms of setting your self-managed shipment fund up or running it 
is this person you should talk to. If you're looking for an NDIS builder who understands the space and going to get your property accredited, we don't do that. But based on our experience, that person is the right person. So sometimes we can take the complexity out of the process by just helping them build their team with the, the, the best people in the industry. Well, Yannick, it's been really interesting to chat so far. Just before I let you go, where would you like to see the company in about 12 months' time from now? And if people want to get more information as well, uh, website, social media, where can we find you? Yeah, we look particularly with NDIS because I, I'm really passionate about helping disabled people. It, it's a very, very important cause to me. I would like us to be able to do a lot more and introduce the, the NDIS investment concept to many, many more of these. We're talking about something that can deliver 10, 15% yield. It's highly leverageable, so you can borrow up to 90% to do it, and the money is still very cheap. So it's, a, it's something that's really good for investors, but it delivers such a social outcome for disabled people. We're currently stuck living in retirement homes when they're 20 mm. hospitals because no one else can care for them. It's just, it's just crucial. So I want to get the word out about NDIS. This is what I want to do over the next 12 months and help as many people get involved as possible. Um, you can find us, it's a fairly easy name to remember, ndislawnexperts.com.au, smsflawnexperts.com.au. Um, we, we'd love to help anyone who is interested in making a difference there and, and helping themselves. Well, Yannick, fingers crossed, I think you're doing a great job and it is, of course, a very worthwhile course to be helping those that are less fortunate than ourselves. So I really do commend you for that and I thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Well, that's Yannick Yeko, the founder and managing director at SMSF Loan Experts and, of course, NDIS Loan Experts as well. And if you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, Calkine Media, so just make sure that you subscribe. I'm James reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph, sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. Innovation today is crossing the bounds of industries to give way to a much more dynamic future. The spheres of innovation have empowered individuals as well as businesses to look beyond existing realms and opt for new age solutions. Be it highly effective marketing strategies and techniques, novel treatment for cancer, research and development of wellness products or innovating health through natural ingredients, the world is witnessing a paradigm shift when newfangled ways of living are replacing conventional concepts and ideas. In Kalkai Media's upcoming webinar, we're putting innovation into the spotlight. Join us live with prominent personalities from three innovative companies who double as Kalkai Media's reputed clients that are leading the innovation charge. On July 28, Kalkai Media will be joined by the executive chairman and CEO of Invian Limited, Thien Chu. We'll also be joined by the founder and CEO of Holistic Coltec. Dr. Rajin Manaka and the CEO of Corporality Global, Priya Mishra, as we take a closer look at some of their incredible products and the work their companies are doing. So if you're keen to see how some of our country's top thinkers are ushering in the new era of tech, healthcare and more, then add it to your calendars. Calcai Media's InvestNest webinar on July 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. Shopify versus Amazon, which tech stock is the better buy amid the sell-off? E-commerce stocks like Shopify and Amazon flourished during the worst spell of COVID-19 as people worldwide switched to a digital lifestyle. But as the pandemic restrictions relax, consumers are slowly returning to stepping out for shopping as more physical stores and malls open up. Please subscribe to the channel. I'm Sage for Kalkai Media. As a result, both Shopify and Amazon seem to be having a very similar experience, being a slowdown in e-commerce activities and significant stock price declines amid a prolonged tech stock sell-off. Is one of them still a better option to explore than the other amid the ongoing sell-off? Let's find out in this video. 
Shopify and Amazon's financial performance in the quarter one financial year 2022. As Shopify and Amazon vary in market size, their financial numbers are also reflecting notable differences. However, one can consider year-over-year -year changes to analyse which one did well in the first quarter of financial year 2022. Shopify posted $1.2 billion US dollars in total revenue in the first three months of financial year 2022, being up by 22% from the first quarter of 2021. The Canadian company reported a net loss of US $1.47 billion in the last quarter and significantly lower than a profit of $1.3 billion US dollars in the previous year's quarter. And meanwhile, Amazon recorded a 7% increase in its net sales to reach 116.4 billion US dollars in the first quarter of financial year 2022, compared to the same quarter a year ago. This US headquartered e commerce giant also posted a net loss of US $3.84 billion in the latest quarter, down from a profit of $8.1 billion US dollars in the first quarter of 2021. Will the adoption of AR technology be the decider? Amazon comparatively has been slow to adopt AR or augmented reality as part of its e-commerce strategy. But in June 2022, they launched a new virtual shopping experience utilizing AR where users can virtually try on shoes before they buy them. Asian e-commerce giants you may have heard of, such as Alibaba and Shopee, have already been using these types of experiences in their platforms through augmented reality protocols where shoppers can try on items in virtual change rooms. Fashion has embraced the online shopping experience for the last 10 years, with websites of horticulture brands such as Burberry being an immersive experience. Now, the metaverse is a new domain that fashion is embracing in the extended reality sphere, with even Fashion Weeks this year having their first metaverse season, including shows, parties and shopping. Shopify is embracing augmented reality shopping tools through Nextech AR's product, Aratize 3D. And this is a one-stop shop AR feature, which enables users to automate the production of 3D model creation at low costs. Brands already enjoying this experience on Shopify include Spike Ball, Pure Cycles, Master and Dynamic, and even more. Leaders in AR development, Niantic Studios, who developed the popular Pokemon Go game, say that AR adoption in e-commerce is a future trend that will be gaining momentum with time and will lead to the mass adoption of AR technology. Stock performances on Shopify and Amazon. Shopify's stock fell by nearly 77% in 12 months, while Amazon's stock plummeted by over 39% in a year. Shop stock was up by almost 8% from a 52-week low of Canadian $386.29 recorded on June the 14th. On the other hand, AMZN stock rose by approximately 5% from its 52-week low of US $101.26 recorded on the 24th of May. According to Refinitiv Data, the Relative Strength Index, or RSI, for SHOP was about 43.03 on June 20th, while for AMZN, it was 40.48, above the oversold level of 30. Bottom line, some market experts believe that though Shopify appears to be more volatile than Amazon at the moment when comparing their stock performance, Shopify's smaller market size could hold significant return potential with evolution in consumers' shopping habits, supported by its growing e-commerce infrastructure. It's also worth noting that these tech giants are still expanding their e-commerce footprints. Also, despite the ongoing market scenario, online stores are gaining popularity and e-commerce players are likely to see massive growth over the years, especially as technology advances. Thanks for joining us on this report. If you like the information, do let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below, subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon. You'll be notified every time Kalkine releases a new video. But for more articles, we update our website regularly. It's kalkinemedia.com. My name's Sage for Kalkine Media. Crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors. 
Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. Australia has been in the midst of a housing crisis for some time, but interestingly, the form of the crisis might be different from what you perceive. According to PropTrack's latest buy or rent report, buying a property looks more feasible than renting for nearly a third of Australian homes. With that said, the struggles of purchasing a home, especially in close proximity to a capital city, is increasingly difficult due to inflation, mortgage rates and an array of taxes. Mortgage rates have shot up by 75 basis points in the current year and rates are expected to increase further still. However, according to PropTrack's latest buy or rent report, 27% of homes in Australia are more cost effective to buy than rent over the next 10 years based on current prices. The report extensively compares the financial costs of both options and identifies the areas where it is cheaper to buy and where it is cheaper to rent across the country. For instance, as the report highlights, more than 50% of homes in Queensland, Western Australia, Brisbane and the Northern Territory are actually cheaper to buy than rent. But Sydney's case is rather different. In Sydney, renting a house is far more affordable than actually buying one. In fact, for the vast majority of New South Wales and also Victoria, only 10% of properties are cheaper to repay via mortgage compared to renting over the course of 10 years. As the rental pressure and high mortgage rates continue, the country is grappling with a rising inflation rate and plummeting vacancy rates. It will be interesting to see how the property market shapes up under the newly elected government and its policies. So are you more inclined to rent or buy? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to like and share the video. You can also subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest content. So talk by Kalkine, the crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year and now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me Sage to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. What's the rift between Australian farmers and supermarket giants? A fight is brewing between Aussie farmers and retailers. And recently a farmer lashed out at supermarket chains and accused them of manipulating prices. A cherry farmer named Guy Gator from New South Wales recently highlighted that the fruit is being sold for around $5 per kilogram. But once there are on the shelves, supermarkets, the price triples. And similarly for lettuce, he informed that it's sold for about $2 to retailers. But once the vegetable hits the shelves of supermarket, it becomes worth $12. The war has opened between the retailers and the farmers, with a number of them refusing to supply to large supermarket chains, including Woolworths and Coles, but not all of them can afford to do so. Ash Saladini, who is the National Farmers Federation economist, Ash stated that there have been many factors behind the price hike of the produce like food and staff shortages and the increase in the cost of freight. Experts have also pointed out that prolonged supply issues have pushed prices to extremes. In the light of allegations being shot at these retail chains, both Coles and Woolworths have denied allegations of price gouging. As reported by the Daily Mail Australia, a spokesperson for Woolworths said that they're paying the market price for fresh fruits and vegetables and these commodities are affected by various factors including the weather, seasonality, supply and demand as well. 
The east coast floods, rains and cold temperatures have also affected the prices since the supply was affected. The spokesperson informed that the market chain is paying more to its suppliers as well. A spokesperson for Coles as well informed that weather conditions have affected the price of produce. In a statement presented by Coles, the retail chain even said that they have been helping the farmers affected by flooding by increasing the amount it paid for produce. As per the retail chains, they're trying to strike the right balance between customers and suppliers. And in the times of peaking inflation, it remains yet to be seen how Australian governments would deal with the problem. Now, if you do like this information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below. Subscribe to the channel. Do press the bell icon. You'll be notified of the most recent videos from Calkine. However, for more articles, do check out the website. It's calkinemedia.com. My name's Sage for Calkine Media. Innovation today is crossing the bounds of industries to give way to a much more dynamic future. The spheres of innovation have empowered individuals as well as businesses to look beyond existing realms and opt for new age solutions. Be it highly effective marketing strategies and techniques, novel treatment for cancer, research and development of wellness products or innovating health through natural ingredients, the world is witnessing a paradigm shift when newfangled ways of living are replacing conventional concepts and ideas. In Kalkai Media's upcoming webinar, we're putting innovation into the spotlight. Join us live with prominent personalities from three innovative companies who double as Kalkai Media's reputed clients that are leading the innovation charge. On July 28, Kalkai Media will be joined by the Executive Chairman and CEO of Indian Limited, Thien Chu. We'll also be joined by the founder and CEO of Holistic Coltech, Dr. Rajin Manika, and the CEO of Corporality Global, Priya Mishra as we take a closer look at some of their incredible products and the work their companies are doing. So if you're keen to see how some of our country's top thinkers are ushering in the new era of tech, healthcare and more, then add it to your calendars. Calcar Media's InvestNest webinar on July 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. Crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Calkine. Overall growth in the UK manufacturing sector has slowed in the last three months. What's more, it's expected to worsen in the upcoming quarter. The sector faces several challenges, namely inflationary pressures, input shortfalls, shipping lags and staffing obstacles. Although with price expectations hitting a nine-month low level, fewer manufacturers are planning on passing on those higher costs to consumers. So amid the slowing growth and falling confidence in the sector, UK investors may want to look into some manufacturing stocks offering decent returns. Let's zoom in on three. The first of which is AstraZeneca. Shares of the pharma giant have given a return of over 20% over the past one year, while its year-to-date return stands at 16%. Now AstraZeneca's market cap sits at around £155 billion. The next one to look at is British American Tobacco. Shares of the cigarette manufacturer have provided a return of over 24% over the past year. Meanwhile, BAT's year-to-date return stands at around 27%. British American Tobacco's market cap sits at around £79 billion. And then finally, Bay Systems or BAE Systems. 
Shares of the Global Arms Security and Aerospace Group have given a return of over 41% over the past year, while the year-to-date return stands at 37%. BAE Systems' market cap sits at £24 billion. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon to stay updated and boost your financial IQ. Crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. Why did Muse Crypto's volume soar over 1,000%? Muse Token's upward movement on Wednesday sharply contrasted with the fall in the broader crypto market. Its trading volume jumped a staggering 1,071% to reach $662,000 for no apparent reason. The token price rose 92.20% to mark this increase in volume, reaching $60.84, this data being current at 1.02 p.m. Eastern Time. Please subscribe to the channel. I'm Sage for Calcine Media. So this increase has stood in stark contrast to the crypto market's decline of 4.65%, reaching $894.18 billion at the same time. Muse is the governance token of NFT20, a decentralized exchange and a permissionless peer-to-peer -peer protocol. It allows users to tokenize their NFTs for trading on decentralized exchanges like Uniswap or SushiSwap. Muse's NFT20 DEX or DEX decentralized exchange and the protocol help users create a new pool or add their NFTs to an existing pool for receiving the derivative ERC20 token in a permissionless way. The ERC20 tokens obtain value from NFTs traded or transferred on decentralized exchanges. The Muse token is traded on exchanges like Gate.io, Coinbase, Hotbit and Uniswap V2. NFT20 has created a secondary market for ERC20 derivatives of NFTs to address the liquidity problem. This provides price exposure to NFT projects without buying NFTs. The protocol also offers NFT swaps in the same pool without tokenizing them, providing collectors with a fair price during trading. The project was co-founded by Jules and Adam, who developed NFT20 without external investments or pre-sale of tokens. According to its website, Muse has more than 298 pools with 22,731 NFTs. More on the Muse token. Muse is the governance token of NFT20. For each NFT deposit, 100 Muse tokens are minted, some of which go to the NFT20 protocol and rest is distributed to Muse token holders. Muse's current market capitalization is 3.5 million US dollars with 3,839 token holders. Its circulating supply is around 508,000. Bottom line, although the project claims to address the liquidity issue in the NFT space by offering the derivative ERC20 token and swapping pools, investors should apply due diligence before investing in digital assets as the unregulated crypto space is susceptible to scams. Thanks for joining us in the report. If you do like the information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below. Subscribe to the channel and do press that bell icon. You'll be notified of every new video by Kalkine. But if you do like the articles, we update our website regularly. Please check it out. It's kalkinemedia.com. My name's Sage for Kalkine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV.
Innovation today is crossing the bounds of industries to give way to a much more dynamic future. The spheres of innovation have empowered individuals as well as businesses to look beyond existing realms and opt for new age solutions. Be it highly effective marketing strategies and techniques, novel treatment for cancer, research and development of wellness products or innovating health through natural ingredients, the world is witnessing a paradigm shift when newfangled ways of living are replacing conventional concepts and ideas. In Kalkai Media's upcoming webinar, we're putting innovation into the spotlight. Join us live with prominent personalities from three innovative companies who double as Kalkai Media's reputed clients that are leading the innovation charge. On July 28, Kalkai Media will be joined by the Executive Chairman and CEO of Indian Limited, Thien Chu. We'll also be joined by the founder and CEO of Holistic Coltech, Dr. Rajin Manika, and the CEO of Corporality Global, Priya Mishra, as we take a closer look at some of their incredible products and the work their companies are doing. So if you're keen to see how some of our country's top thinkers are ushering in the new era of tech, healthcare, and more, then add it to your calendars. Kalkai Media's InvestNest webinar on July 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. Hello, great to have your company. I'm James Preston for Kalkai Media and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. In this edition, I'll be shining a light on VIN Zero, and the best way to do that is to sit down with the CEO of VIN Zero, Paul Laycock. Paul, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks, James. Pleasure to be here. Well, Paul, first and foremost, what is it exactly that VIN Zero does? So, to put it simply, VIN Zero is a supplier of design technology and, and ways to manage data for the architectural engineering, construction, and manufacturing marketplace. So. We're bringing solutions together to connect all these different segments together uh, with their design and bringing their data together. And then the whole goal of Vinzero is having a, a major drive on helping helping our customers move their designs to net zero. So it's really important that, that we provide the technology to help them transform the industry because the, unfortunately the construction industry is a long way behind in transforming mm. and being more efficient. So this is our contribution to trying to drive this industry towards uh, digital transformation. So run me through exactly how the technology works to actually help achieve those net zero targets. What, what does it look for? Okay, so there's a lot of different technologies that plug in for any, whether it's an architect or an engineer, to do a design or start working on a design and or through the construction phase. So the problem with driving towards net zero is having all these different people having access to information to allow them to make those decisions okay so for instance you know uh, if you go back 10 years ago an architect would walk into they'd have a library they'd walk in there and they'd get all the latest books that might have come out from a manufacturer like fish and pakel or something similar right mm. but that's way too slow on how fast industry works now so by having a way that these systems can actually access the data and the manufacturers are providing their content with all the, the attributes and information about the effects of that, that piece of uh, manufactured equipment. So, you know, is it, has it been put together at net zero or driving towards net zero? Is, is it an efficient use of power, etc.? So if, if designers have access to that information at their fingertips, they can make easier and quicker decisions to start to do that transformation versus having to do lots and lots of research and trying to find all this information out. So it's about bringing the data together through all these different industries and bringing it together so a designer can make the right decisions or the, the mm. best decisions. Well, you mentioned different industries there. Obviously, we've already touched on the construction industry, but what other industries has VinZero worked with and, and which ones seem to be getting the most benefit out of your projects? Look. One of, one of the, the great factors in what we do, it really works across both the architectural, the engineering and the construction industry. But then because we're tying in the, the use or in you know, the major use in these industries of manufactured goods. So working with all those manufacturers and, and helping them design and, and get the products correct for net zero 
and then these other groups having access to that, we're really touching on across that whole whole scope of that industry. So mm. we're lucky. We work with anything from car designers to to councils building roads or, you know, people building high rise buildings to single story homes to desks, furniture. We really work across everything that's designed and modeled in three D, we, we work across. So we really feel because of the size of our global company now, we can really have an effect on, on this pathway. Well, just a little bit of a tangent here, because, I mean, you've just mentioned that you work with councils on roads, for example. One thing we've seen with all the rain recently is that there's been a lot of degradation to the roads, huge potholes everywhere. How can your projects be incorporated to fix those kind of issues, which seem to be occurring quite a lot recently? Yeah, look, probably gets a, a difficult one on, on the maintenance side because a lot of that's, uh, I guess, patchwork and they try to get things back up and running. And <laughs> we've certainly had our share of that here in Queensland with the, with, with the floods and everything that's happened. But I think where it becomes more important is as you look at the future designs and we're looking at the roads and we're looking at the bridges and having, having access to the right types of materials and construction materials that will hold, hold up against events such as this and and it's the most cost effective ways to repair those those types of things so you know if you look at uh, road design and they have to go pull up a whole complete piece of road and redo the road that can cost a lot of money versus looking at solutions that might just resurface that part of the road so mm. there's a lot of factors maintenance is always a really is, is a bit of a tough one unless it's a major overhaul but where we're really focused on is trying to build our new infrastructure our global infrastructure whether that's roads or buildings um, or, or manufacturers, building them in the right way to start with stepping us towards that net zero. And, and it's, it, it's, it's a wild, it's a, it's a big jungle out there trying to find the right information, which product's a bit better than a, another product in that respect. And I think this will make our manufacturers also promote which products are driving towards net zero and, and, and helping us as, as a global community. Well, Paul, I'd also love if you could take me through the Autodesk Construction Cloud. How can that be used by various companies? Yeah, so, so again, it, it's really funny when you start thinking about all these designs, everything I'm talking about, it's all just data. And the problem with all this data, if you look at what's happened typically in the, in the past is every business and segments, segments within a business had all their own little patches of data, but it wasn't connected. The great thing about the Autodesk um, Construction Cloud it's allowing us to build pathways to put all this data together and have that data accessible by everybody. And then to the next extent where we can look at that project and monitor that project and everybody's working on the one project and sharing that information. And those design ideas can be, can be shared and adopted even, even during construction. So it's just making decisions a lot easier and getting the right information to these people to make the right decision. Because there's one thing, if, if you look at designers over, over the years, they want to design something that stays around. They want to design something that's efficient. And I believe they want to design smart buildings. They want to design buildings that are good for our environment and have at least the least effect on our environment. Our jobs to provide them the information and provide them some consulting around that. So one of my big drives is bringing other areas involved into the construction industry. So that could be bringing agronomists in, solar experts, uh, could be bringing agricultural scientists in. It's getting a lot of different knowledge bases coming together now to look at when we're doing a building, how do we make that building a much greater benefit for for the, I guess, the community, but also then leading on to the, the environment. Well, Paul, one big sort of trend that's emerged in the past few years has been that of NDIS buildings. Are you doing a lot of work in that space, for example? Look, a lot of, a lot of our different designers plug in and work across all those different types of types of segments. And I guess when it starts getting into to those areas, it, it's making sure that the buildings meet the requirements of, of, of what the people that need that type of um, housing or, or accommodation or whether it's a rehab center, et cetera, to, to mm. utilize. Again, it just comes down to those designers knowing what they can put, put in there and getting the latest, the latest information from manufacturers because once you go past the walls and the windows and the doors and you start looking at what goes into a building, there's literally thousands and thousands of suppliers that are providing those types of those types of products. What we need to do is make sure we're, we're picking the product that suits the, 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 I guess, the end client or the end user 
but we also then have the choice to make sure that those products are going to, going to step us towards net zero. Paul, do you typically find that VinZero is the one reaching out to other companies or are they now definitely coming to you looking to ensure that they can get this net zero target on board? Yeah, look, I, I think it, it's, it's a massive, it, it is a massive trend that's it's just building up underneath the whole construction marketplace. And I think it's it's very consumer driven as well. Like I, I think people want to know if they put an oven in a house or they put a bench top in a house, it, it's it's renewable, you know, and you look at what we're doing with the ways we, we select our food and, and consumables. So I think there's a major um, drive from the from the consumer. And what we're finding is our clients are, are coming to us and wanting to know how do they bring their systems together to enable them to meet these requirements but keep keep the processes working well and keep building on time and getting hold of all the construction materials. So you know, it's a bit of a unique situation with what we've gone through in the last few years where there's a struggle on getting components and building materials. Mm -hmm. um, there's differences. Some places there's not a lot of building activity. In other places it's really going, you know, the building industry is, is going quite, quite um, hard. And we've got people issues with, you know, not being able to rent houses. So the, it's a real, real funny situation that, that we that we find ourselves in. But one thing that comes out of these types of situations in my, in, in, I guess, in my experience is it starts to make designers and, and make um, people in the industry think about smarter ways to do things. And our community has to start thinking about smarter ways to house themselves and 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 build communities that we can we can provide you know housing and put a roof over people's people's heads so there, there's some genuine issues going going on in our in our country country today that we have to we have to solve and and you know i hope i hope our government's got their their ears on to to focus on these things because they have to drive these changes i mean let's just talk about manufacture we, we everything's manufactured out of country there has to be a trend i'm calling i'm calling it manufacture in country we have to manufacture and we have to design in, in country. Now, we don't have a, a huge population, so we can't afford for a thousand or, you know, let's say a hundred manufacturers to go and manufacture washing machines. But I would hope the government starts to, th to think about ways to build where, um, like manufacturing plants and warehouses that, that have different types of technology, robotic technology, et cetera, in there to start building components and then allowing different manufacturers to plug into those components to build what we need because we have to become more sustainable in our own yes. in our own country and we have to have control then over those materials we're using in that to make us more sustainable so this whole idea of buying everything overseas and importing everything i i think our consumers are wanting that to change i think they're prepared to pay more to have the change to know that, that they've got a continual supply and they're getting quality and they and they're having a great effect on the on the global environment Paul, you're 100% correct. I mean, you know, you look at the issues with China over the past 12 months, maybe even preceding that, of course, there's been tensions with Taiwan, there's been the, the shooting of protesters in Hong Kong. I mean, this is a, a nation that's caused a lot of issues, not to mention the wine bans, everything. So, uh, yeah, I, I think given the amount of uh, minerals and commodities that we have right here in Australia, whether it be coal or otherwise, I mean, it's a, it's a resource-rich country. And you just, you look at the difference. I mean, previously we had Holden plants here and now all that's gone as well. So, you, you know, you've hit the nail on the head there. I think given how much of an infrastructure boom we've got going on at the moment, let's turn it back to here. That's right. And if you look at a lot of the products that, that are manufactured, there's, there's lots of different componentries. We've just got to get smart about how we build that together and, and how we can use robotics and to keep our, our costs reasonable. And robotics isn't there to replace our greater workforce. You know, governments, we all have to listen. We all, we all have to do, do something a little bit different and a little bit better. And we've got to make, we've got to make Australia a lot more self-sufficient, a lot more self-sufficient. Absolutely. Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure to chat. And I certainly do hope that VinZero is indeed victorious. So thank you so much for your time. Take care. Thank you very much. Well, that's Paul Laycock, the CEO of Vinzero. And if you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, Kalkai Media. So just make sure that you subscribe. I'm James, reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai. Hello.
everyone. Good afternoon. Great to have your company here on Calkine TV. I'm Holly, and you're watching The Buzzing Trends. Today, we're looking at ASX gold miners' stocks hitting their multi-year lows recently. But before we dive in, let's briefly take a look at the gold market performance. The S&P ASX 200 is up today, gaining 18.9 points, or 0.29 percent. And over the past five days, the index has been virtually unchanged, but has been down over 11 percent for the previous year. The ASX 200 Resources Index emerged as one of the worst performers on the 11th of July, ending up at 1.53 percent. And today, the story is not much different for the index, as it was down 0.18 percent during the afternoon session. The other reason behind the continued weakness in gold stocks is the dim economic outlook, creating uncertainty among investors. Weak commodity prices are also weighing on the ASX-listed gold miners, as investors are also closely awaiting U.S. inflation data for June on Wednesday. And in case consumer prices surge further, the Fed is expected to hike interest rates yet again. And investors have traditionally invested in the yellow metal amid uncertain times. Higher interest rates have increased the attractiveness of government debt. And as a result, gold has become less attractive to investors over the past week. Gold spot prices have fallen below the psychological $1,800 U.S. barrier. And meanwhile, on Monday, the price of the yellow metal slipped to a nine-month low amid rate hike concerns and a surge in U.S. dollar. The U.S. gold futures declined 0.6% to $1,731 U.S. dollars. Now, looking at the performance of ASX-listed gold miners, shares of Newcrest Mining and Evolution hit their multi-year lows on Monday, the 11th of July. Despite no price-sensitive news coming from the companies, but the major reason behind this significant fall in share prices was a broad decline witnessed in the resources sector on Monday. Newcrest shares fell to a multi-year low of $19.06 on Monday, although the shares finally closed 2.53% down at 19.26. And today, Newcrest mining shares saw a modest gain as it was trading at around 19.30, up 0.10% during the afternoon. Meanwhile, the stock is still down over 21 percent on a year-to-date basis. In the past year, the share price has fallen over 25 percent and slipped over 16 in the past month. Now to Evolution Mining's share price, which has hit a multi-year low of $2.31 on Monday. It laid apart some losses and ended 4.9 percent lower at $2.33 apiece. And this morning, Evolution Mining shares saw a modest gain of 0.86 but dropped 0.43 percent to trade at just over $2.32 during the afternoon session. Meanwhile, the stock is down nearly 42 percent on a year-to-date basis. And over the past year, the share price has fallen 49 percent and 29 percent in the past month. Now, that is a wrap on the show, but do remember that an investor's goal while looking at gold mining stocks is to explore if these stocks can generate income for them in the future. Although gold has been going sideways for a long period and certain stocks have fallen short of investor expectations, the world also faces crunch supply and demand issues and weak commodity prices. So it will be interesting to see just how these ASX-listed gold stocks perform in the future. That is a wrap on the buzzing trends. Stay tuned for more on Calcine TV. I'm Holly Shield signing off. Hi there, James Preston for Calcine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV.
crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. The IEA has projected that global energy investments are set to surge by 8% this year to 2.4 trillion US dollars. More importantly, this estimated growth is expected to be primarily driven by clean energy. So that said, let's explore three tier 6 listed stocks that could benefit from the clean energy revolution. The first one is Algonquin Power and Utilities Corp. Algonquin's subsidiary Liberty expanded its renewable partnership with social media giant Meta to include 112 megawatt wind project in Michigan in May. This wind facility is projected to begin its commercial operations in 2023. Algonquin significantly improved its cash flow from operating activities by 168% year over year to $162.2 million in the first three months of financial year 22. AQN stock slipped, however, by almost 7% year-to-date. Interjex Renewable Energy Interjex acquired three operational wind facilities in Chile for a purchase price of $861 million Canadian dollars on June 9. And with this wind portfolio, the company has become one of the biggest renewable energy power players in the region. Stocks of Interjex zoomed by about 9% from a 52-week low of 15.89 Canadian. Another stock to eye is TransAlta Renewables. TransAlta said that its renewable power production rose by 201 gigawatts per hour in the first quarter, compared to the same quarter that ended March 31, 2021. This enhanced power production capacity was primarily due to the newly commissioned Windrose site and recently acquired economic stakes in the Skookumchuck, that is wind, and North Carolina solar farm. The mid-cap renewable energy company believes that higher wind resources in the US and Canada also improved its production capacity. RNW script plunged, however, by around 20% in 12 months. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon to stay updated and boost your financial IQ. I'm Holly Shields for Calcine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calcine TV. While inflation in the UK continues to rise, the salaries of workers haven't risen with it. Yearly pay growth stood at 4% in May, which is less than half the 9.1% inflation that was reported. What's more, a survey last month by the Bank of England has shown that employers do not have plans for any further pay rises. So in light of this, let's take a look at some FTSE listed recruitment stocks and how they've been faring. Hayes offers recruitment services in 32 countries and operates 256 offices across the world. It offers permanent, contractual and temporary staffing services in various sectors. The FTSE 250 constituents' shares have given a return of negative 30% over the past one year, while Hayes' year-to-day return, on the other hand, stands at around negative 23%. Page Group the recruitment consultancy provides services to organizations requiring permanent, temporary and contractual personnel. The FTSE 250 company's one-year return stands at negative 32% and its year-to-date return, on the other hand, stands at negative 37%. S3 S3 is a global specialist staffing company with operations in several regions, including the UK and Ireland, US, Europe, Asia-Pacific and the Middle East. 
In the six months to May 31, the company posted a 23% rise in net fees on a year-on-year -year basis. S3's share value has depreciated, however, over 25% over the past year, while its year-to-day return stands at negative 27%. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon, stay updated, and boost your financial IQ. I'm Holly Shields for Kalkai Media. Innovation today is crossing the bounds of industries to give way to a much more dynamic future. The spheres of innovation have empowered individuals as well as businesses to look beyond existing realms and opt for new age solutions be it highly effective marketing strategies and techniques, novel treatment for cancer, research and development of wellness products or innovating health through natural ingredients. The world is witnessing a paradigm shift when newfangled ways of living are replacing conventional concepts and ideas. In Kalkai Media's upcoming webinar, we're putting innovation into the spotlight. Join us live with prominent personalities from three innovative companies who double as Kalkai Media's reputed clients that are leading the innovation charge. On July 28, Kalkai Media will be joined by the executive chairman and CEO of Invian Limited, Thien Chu. We'll also be joined by the founder and CEO of Holistic Coltec, Dr. Rajin Manika, and the CEO of Corporality Global, Priya Mishra as we take a closer look at some of their incredible products and the work their companies are doing. So if you're keen to see how some of our country's top thinkers are ushering in the new era of tech, healthcare and more, then add it to your calendars. Kalkai Media's Invest Nest webinar on July 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones for Calkine Media. Welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today, I'm speaking with Scott McMillan. He's Managing Director of Invictus Energy. Now, Invictus is an independent upstream oil and gas company focused on sub-Saharan Africa. Its asset portfolio consists of a highly prospective license in the Kabora Basa Basin in Zimbabwe. Here to tell us more is Scott. Welcome, Scott. Hi, Rachel, and thank you for having me. Great to speak with you today. So everyone's awaiting Invictus's upcoming drilling program from the world-class Makuyu prospect, which is previously called the Mazazarabani prospect. How is the plan progressing? Look, it's progressing really well. We've um, we completed our seismic campaign last year, and the, um, the basis of that was to refine the, the drilling location for the Makuyu prospect, previously called the Muzurabani prospect, but also to identify some additional prospectivity within our license area. Uh, we've secured a, a rig, the Exalos uh, number 202, that's currently drilling in Tanzania and will be coming to us and mobilizing next month in, in May uh, to prepare uh, for that drilling campaign. That will be two wells, so Makuyu and another uh, that's Scott McMillan, Managing Director of Invictus Energy. And if you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, Kalkai Media, so make sure to subscribe. I'm Rachel, reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones and you're watching Kalkai Media's Trending Business News. Now, buy now, pay later companies, Sezzle and Zip have mutually agreed to terminate their agreement and their plans of a merger. 
that was decided back in February this year. This termination is effective immediately. Now, as part of the mutual termination, Cezil will receive from Zip US 11 million US dollars. That's around 16.6 million dollars Australian, and that's to come cover among other things Cezil's legal accounting and other costs associated with the transaction. Co-founder, CEO and executive chairman of CESL, Charlie Yerkim, says, while we were excited by the potential of this transaction, our board and management team are laser focused on our strategy and execution. CESL is headquartered in the US. It's a fintech payment platform that increases purchasing power for millions of consumers by offering interest-free installment plans on online stores and select in-store locations. Zip is an Australian public limited financial technology company founded in 2013. In September 2020, Zip acquired the US-based Buy Now Pay Later company called QuadPay to grow their American footprint. Shares in Zip jumped 10% to up to 55 cents, while Cezil dropped 30.1 percent to 29 cents after the two companies agreed to terminate their merger agreement. Well, that's all from me for now, but stay tuned to Calkine TV for all the business news that matters. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. Many digital assets have gained over the past few days and one of them is brain trust. There's a notable surge in the tokens trading volume as well. So what is brain trust and why is its crypto gaining right now? Let's explore. The platform is working to be the first decentralized network for job hunting and talent acquisition. Braintrust wants to bridge the gap between job seekers and companies. On its official website, the company is highlighting freelance work for job seekers. What seems to be unique is the promise of no membership costs and fees, as Braintrust claims that the person who lands a job can have all of the payouts. But it's the platform's decentralized services powered by a native token which make it a participant in the cryptoverse. BTRST is said to have a utility in the governance of the network. Holders can decide how the network is run. The token, also known as the Braintrust Crypto, can be used to incentivize users for their activities on the network. BTRST can be earned by referring Braintrust services to other freelancers and the crypto uses the blockchain network of Ethereum. The Braintrust token's market cap is over $180 million and it's trading at the price of just over two US dollars. The 24-hour trading volume of the token is up almost 500%, which has pushed the price up nearly 50%. So what's driving these gains? Well, one of the probable causes behind the surge might be the announcement of its partnership with Behance 
Adobe's social media network. Another catalyst behind BTRST token surge could be the report that Brain Trust has helped people make 75 million US dollars through the jobs it's provided. Plus, Brain Trust also claims that big names like Nestle and NASA are using its services to hire people. What's your take on the platform and its crypto? Let us know in the comments and hit that bell icon. I'm Holly Shields for Calcine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Innovation today is crossing the bounds of industries to give way to a much more dynamic future. The spheres of innovation have empowered individuals as well as businesses to look beyond existing realms and opt for new age solutions. Be it highly effective marketing strategies and techniques, novel treatment for cancer, research and development of wellness products or innovating health through natural ingredients, the world is witnessing a paradigm shift when newfangled ways of living are replacing conventional concepts and ideas. In Kalkai Media's upcoming webinar, we're putting innovation into the spotlight. Join us live with prominent personalities from three innovative companies who double as Kalkai Media's reputed clients that are leading the innovation charge. On July 28, Kalkai Media will be joined by the Executive Chairman and CEO of Indian Limited, Thien Chu. We'll also be joined by the Founder and CEO of Holista Coltech, Dr. Rajin Manika, and the CEO of Corporality Global, Priya Mishra as we take a closer look at some of their incredible products and the work that companies are doing. So if you're keen to see how some of our country's top thinkers are ushering in the new era of tech, healthcare and more, then add it to your calendars. Calcar Media's InvestNest webinar on July 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. Does Arbitrum Crypto exist? Here's all you need to know. The Ethereum blockchain scaling solution, Arbitrum, is widely known in the cryptocurrency community. The Layer 2 scaling solution is intended to increase the functionality of Ethereum smart contracts. On June 22nd, it appeared that crypto enthusiasts were looking for Arbitrum Crypto as a major development was associated with it. Please subscribe to the channel, I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Crypto enthusiasts could be looking for Arbitrum Crypto as it launched one of the largest non-fungible token or NFT drops ever. On June 21st, the Ethereum scaling solution announced that the event would span two months and encourage users to use various on-chain Arbitrum platforms to accomplish multiple objectives. In the crypto realm, getting free NFTs always attracts traction. Rubik, a multi-chain swap protocol offering alluring terms to its users, is one of the bridges in this effort. So what is Arbitrum? Arbitrum is a layer two or L2 scaling solution that promises to increase Ethereum's transactional throughput while lowering transactional fees. Arbitrum holds one of the top spots among layer two platforms on Ethereum and has over 260 decentralized applications or dApps deployed. Meanwhile, the scaling solution reportedly has more than 2 billion US dollars in total value locked. The NFT drop event is called Arbitrum Odyssey and at the end of the eight week long event, users will receive special NFTs as a reward for completing the voyage, which they can then use to distribute more airdrops. The bridges, exchanges and on-ramp projects that are part of this effort are the focus of each of the eight weeks. To receive rewards, users must accomplish certain tasks on the blockchain. They will have to perform a swap on one platform, offer liquidity on another, and so forth. 
interested people must note that Rubik is participating in the event's first week and anyone can participate in this event using the Rubik Exchange to convert any token to ETH using the Arbitrum blockchain. Bottom line, despite the hype around the event, potential investors must note that Arbitrum Crypto does not exist and is just a layer two scaling solution. And meanwhile, the crypto market continues to suffer due to increased volatility in 2022. After showing some signs of recovery over the last few days, the valuation of the crypto market dipped on Wednesday by 3.8% at the time of writing this report. Thanks for joining us. If you do like the information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below. Subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon. You'll be notified of the most recent videos from Kalkine. For more articles, head to the website kalkinemedia.com. This is Sage for Kalkine Media. So talk by Kalkine, the crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year and now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me Sage to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. What is Clearwater or Clear Crypto? Let's talk price and performance. Clearwater Crypto has caught the eyes of the crypto enthusiasts as a climate change debate heats up. The token traded flat, but its volume fell 91% in the trailing 24 hours to Thursday afternoon. On the other hand, the global crypto market surged 2.76% to reach US $932.65 billion on Thursday morning, while its volume in the last 24 hours fell 17.93% to US $53.49 billion. Please subscribe to the channel. Sage here for Kalkine Media. Here we explore the Clearwater or Clear Crypto's recent trading performance. What is Clearwater, Clear Crypto? The Clearwater project is built on the Binance Smart Chain. It was launched in 2022 by a US-based team. The project helps investors earn rewards while providing them with a passive opportunity to fight the negative human impact on the planet through clean water solutions. It claims to be in the final stage of its aluminium bottled beverage line, expected in the third quarter of 2022. Clearwater distributes 5% of its profits to token holders as airdrop dividends. It also plans to print QR codes on each aluminium bottled beverage to direct consumers to the Clearwater website, where users can learn more about Clearwater crypto. The project focuses on a circular economy in three aspects, water, waste and mobility. It intends to tackle the negative human impact on the planet by replacing plastic bottles with recyclable, reusable and environmentally friendly aluminium bottles.
In addition, it would also provide funding for ocean cleanup projects and ground drinking water wells. The company would charge a 10% tax on each transaction, of which 4% would go to the liquidity pool, 2% for holder awards, 2% for marketing and 2% for dev wallet. Many social media users have commented on the Clearwater business model. They believe its aluminium bottle business would bring reliability to the crypto when it hits the market in quarter three. The bottom line. The Clear token was priced at US 0.0001032 at 10.51 a.m. Eastern Time on July 7th, being up 0.37%, while its volume for the last 24 hours fell 91.13% to US $88,810. It has a market cap of $513,837 and its fully diluted market cap is US $1.03 million. The token has a maximum supply of 10 billion and its total and current circulating supply of 5 billion. It returned gains of 30.28% in the last seven days while increasing 89.1% over the past 30 days, according to CoinMarketCap. Thank you for joining us on this report. If you do like the information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below. Subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, you'll be notified of the most recent videos from Calkine. For more articles, head to the website calkinemedia.com. Stay tuned for Calkine Media. Crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. SSC is a leading generator of electricity across the world. It's also one of the largest renewable electricity network companies in the UK. The company develops, owns and operates low carbon infrastructure to support the zero carbon transition. Formerly known as Scottish and Southern Energy, the business was incorporated in 1989. It became SSC in September of 2011. The company supports zero carbon transitions through offshore and onshore wind, hydropower, electricity transmission and distribution grids, as well as efficient gas fire generation. It currently has around 10,000 skilled employees. The company's core focus is to attain economically regulated electricity networks and renewables complemented by businesses with a key role in enabling the net zero transition. SSC is working to be a leading energy company in a net zero world. The business's goals align with the UN's Sustainable Development Goals as well, which is designed to drive faster decarbonization across the next decade. First, SSC aims to cut carbon intensity by 80%. The company is also trying to increase renewable energy output fivefold. It's working to enable low carbon generation and demand, and plus, it aims to champion a fair and just energy transition. SSE has a prominent presence in Great Britain and Northern Ireland, plus the Republic of Ireland, Japan, Spain, Portugal, Denmark, and Poland. The company is based in Perth and the UK. So there you have it, that is SSE in a nutshell. Do you think this company should be included in your investing journey? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to like and share the video. I'm Holly Shields reporting for Kalkai Media. Innovation today is crossing the bounds of industries to give way to a much more dynamic future. The spheres of innovation have empowered individuals as well as businesses to look beyond existing realms and opt for new age solutions. Be it highly effective marketing strategies and techniques, novel treatment for cancer, research and development of wellness products or innovating health through natural ingredients, 
the world is witnessing a paradigm shift when newfangled ways of living are replacing conventional concepts and ideas. In Kaokai Media's upcoming webinar, we're putting innovation into the spotlight. Join us live with prominent personalities from three innovative companies who double as Kaokai Media's reputed clients that are leading the innovation charge. On July 28, Kaokai Media will be joined by the Executive Chairman and CEO of Indian Limited, Thien Chu. We'll also be joined by the Founder and CEO of Holistic Coltech, Dr. Rajin Manaka, and the CEO of Corporality Global, Priya Mishra as we take a closer look at some of their incredible products and the work that companies are doing. So if you're keen to see how some of our country's top thinkers are ushering in the new era of tech, healthcare and more, then add it to your calendars. Kaokai Media's InvestNest webinar on July 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. Crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. NFT Corner, LimeWire Marketplace and Lions Not Sheep NFTs launched. Amid the disturbances in the cryptoverse, which include Voyager Digital's bankruptcy filing, the NFT space is busy with the latest launches. NFTs or non-fungible tokens are known for their uniqueness as no single token resembles any other, making noise in the second half of 2022. Let's find out more. Please subscribe to the channel. I'm Sage for Kalkai Media. The first half was dominated by the news of Madonna entering NFTs in collaboration with Beepool and Coco Gauff using the Autograph platform to release her digital assets. And now things have expanded with the new marketplace, LimeWire, and a new set of digital assets by a popular apparel company, Lions Not Sheep. Let us explore the two latest developments. LimeWire NFT launch. LimeWire has now finally gone live as a marketplace for digital assets after having teased NFT enthusiasts with the waitlist participation. LimeWire has unveiled its partnerships with some big names in the entertainment industry. One of these is Travis Barker, a musician who also remains in the limelight for his relationship with one of the Kardashian sisters, Courtney. The Travis Barker NFT can be listed soon on LimeWire and for now enthusiasts can have their hands on some LimeWire Originals NFTs. The platform invited people for Originals waitlist which is now listed. It is notable that Barker's NFT might represent a real drum kit. Other names that can have LimeWire listed NFTs include Nicky Jam, H, Elijah Blake, and Dylan Francis, and these assets might be launched in a phased manner. Lions Not Sheep NFTs. This Utah-based apparel company has taken a plunge into the digital asset space. Lions Not Sheep sells clothing and accessories on its own website, as well as on e-commerce websites like Amazon. The Lions Not Sheep NFT can be minted using a credit or a debit card, and the company claims that 1% of the mint revenue will be contributed to programs for military veterans. The company has also announced the launch of a metaverse-based event next year. The owners of Lions Not Sheep NFTs will have entry to the event, which will be simultaneously also conducted in person. After the company's NFTs are minted, the process of purchase on marketplaces like OpenSea might start. NFTs are being unveiled alongside new marketplaces like LimeWire, which might be 
some positive signals for the wider cryptoverse. How Lions, Not Sheep NFTs and LimeWire's new launches consisting of the Travis Barker NFT will perform might become clear only in the coming months. Thanks for joining us. Now, if you do like this information, let us know by liking, sharing and commenting on the video below and subscribe to the channel. Press that bell icon. You'll be notified of the most recent videos from Kalkine. But for more articles, there's a website. Have a look. KalkineMedia.com. My name's Sage for Kalkine Media. Crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. With the crypto market having collapsed in spectacular fashion, large exchanges have either suspended trading, collapsed, or in the case of Voyager, have filed for bankruptcy. And specifically for Voyager, Chapter 11 in the New York Bankruptcy Court. And in this video, I'll take you through exactly what that means. Just before I do though, the crypto market remains inherently volatile, so it's incredibly important that you do your own research. Now for some quick context, Voyager is a high profile crypto broker an intermediary between investor and the market who makes trades on the investor's behalf to help maximize returns. Voyager has of course filed for bankruptcy, citing market volatility and the surprising collapse of Three Arrows Capital. So with all that said, what exactly is Chapter 11 bankruptcy? Put simply, it's one of the many forms of what any debtor might use to deal with the debt. Chapter 11, however, can be a good start for the overall restructuring of debts, which makes it more of a bankruptcy targeted towards reorganization as opposed to winding up a company. Chapter 11 has been used for leading companies of the US in the past to help restructure their debt and tide over a crisis phase. Many might recall vehicle giant General Motors filing for one in 2009 in the wake of its liabilities growing more than double as compared to the company's assets. Fast forward to 2022 and General Motors is actually still humming along quite nicely. In a Chapter 11 bankruptcy, the company files a reorganization plan with the court. This can restructure their debt, which can be in the best interest of creditors. Voyager's filing reportedly suggests that its debt and liabilities are roughly in the same range. Secondly, much of the pain of the brokerage emanates from another crypto player, namely Three Arrows Capital and it going bust. Voyager has also stated that Chapter 11 can enable it to reimburse its customers. In the proposed plan, users that had fiat currency assets in Voyager would be able to access them once the reorganization is effectively implemented. Voyager is of course not alone in its struggles. Vold has recently declared a halt on withdrawals and Celsius is, excuse the pun, feeling the heat. July 6 and July 7 have been a good 48 hours for the crypto market with Bitcoin, Ethereum and the overall market cap 
seeing some strong gains, but there's still a very long way to go to recover those losses that have been incurred since November 2021. Ultimately, the Chapter 11 bankruptcy might not be a bad deal for Voyager customers. A reorganisation of debt and a restructuring of operations can enable the company to return funds to enthusiasts who flock to the platform anticipating mega, mega returns in the form of cryptocurrency. Voyager can still operate, but it does have a mess to sort through before it will be truly functional. Despite the recent collapse, are you still bullish on crypto overall and digital assets? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to like and share the video. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and don't forget to press the bell icon. I'm James. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Innovation today is crossing the bounds of industries to give way to a much more dynamic future. The spheres of innovation have empowered individuals as well as businesses to look beyond existing realms and opt for new age solutions. Be it highly effective marketing strategies and techniques, novel treatment for cancer, research and development of wellness products or innovating health through natural ingredients, the world is witnessing a paradigm shift when newfangled ways of living are replacing conventional concepts and ideas. In Kaokai Media's upcoming webinar, we're putting innovation into the spotlight. Join us live with prominent personalities from three innovative companies who double as Kaokai Media's reputed clients that are leading the innovation charge. On July 28, Kaokai Media will be joined by the Executive Chairman and CEO of Indian Limited, Thien Chu. We'll also be joined by the Founder and CEO of Holista Coltec, Dr. Rajin Manika and the CEO of Corporality Global, Priya Mishra, as we take a closer look at some of their incredible products and the work their companies are doing. So if you're keen to see how some of our country's top thinkers are ushering in the new era of tech, healthcare and more, then add it to your calendars. Kalkai Media's InvestNest webinar on July 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. After a string of resignations from the cabinet, PM Boris Johnson has stepped down from his position as the ruling party leader on Thursday. It's said that Johnson will be continuing until autumn, after which a new leader will be chosen as the next PM. And while the UK's government is folding under pressures, the economy is not much better. In an effort to improve the situation, the Bank of England has pledged to bring down the inflation levels to the 2% target, while further rate hikes are expected on the horizon. But amid all this turmoil, the FTSE was trading higher on Thursday. Let's take a look at some blue chip stocks for investors to keep an eye on. Imperial Brands Tobacco producer has given its shareholders a positive return of 16% on a one-year basis and it has a year-to-date return of 11.67%. IMB also has a positive EPS of 3.0 and P&E ratio is standing at 8.49 as of the 7th of July. The company holds a market cap of around £17 billion. British American Tobacco The company is offering an annual dividend yield of 6.3% and with a positive EPS of 2.97, BAT's P&E ratio stands at 12.06. On a one-year basis, the stock has given a return of over 21% to investors, and then on a year-to-date basis, it's given 24.49%. British American Tobacco holds a market cap of £78 billion. Vodafone Group The leading telecom firm has given a return of 7%, while on a year-to-date basis, it's given 13.7%. With a positive EPS of 0.07, VOD's P&E ratio stands at just over 20. The company holds a market cap of £35 billion. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon. I'm Holly Shields for Calpine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. 
Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. VIDT Datalink is a hybrid blockchain validation network that aims to protect the digital data of enterprises against manipulation or fraud. The platform's VID protects digital files from illegal activities and as a blockchain network, it can seamlessly fit into any existing system without impacting workflows. This way, organizations will not have to adjust too much to make way for the VIDT ecosystem. Leading companies like IBM, DJO, Amspec as well all use VIDT's Datalink ecosystem to certify and secure digital documents. The platform is governed by its native token, VIDT, and just recently, the crypto saw a price rally of over 139% and a massive volume spike of over 7,318%. Now, the exact reason for this rise is unclear, but VIDT seems to be on a bullish trend of late. The 565th ranked token has amassed over 167% in the last 14 days, and over the past week, it's gained over 150%. The project, founded by Marnix Vandenberg, Pim Boetz and Cecil van Helden, can validate a file on the system through its ability to store digital fingerprints on the blockchain. Plus, through the VIDT crypto, NFT users too can verify and validate transactions, thereby ensuring immutability. What's your take on the VIDT data link and its crypto? Let us know in the comments and hit that bell icon to stay updated. I'm Holly Shields reporting for Calcai Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Innovation today is crossing the bounds of industries to give way to a much more dynamic future. The spheres of innovation have empowered individuals as well as businesses to look beyond existing realms and opt for new age solutions. Be it highly effective marketing strategies and techniques, novel treatment for cancer, research and development of wellness products or innovating health through natural ingredients, the world is witnessing a paradigm shift when newfangled ways of living are replacing conventional concepts and ideas. In Kalkai Media's upcoming webinar, we're putting innovation into the spotlight. Join us live with prominent personalities from three innovative companies who double as Kalkai Media's reputed clients that are leading the innovation charge. On July 28, Kalkai Media will be joined by the executive chairman and CEO of Indian Limited, Thien Chu. We'll also be joined by the founder and CEO of Holistic Coltec, Dr. Rajin Manaka, and the CEO of Corporality Global, Priya Mishra, as we take a closer look at some of their incredible products and the work the companies are doing. So if you're keen to see how some of our country's top thinkers are ushering in the new era of tech, healthcare, and more, then add it to your calendars. Calcar Media's Invest Nest webinar on July 28, 2022 at 12.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time.
crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. Why e stablecoin could be a game changer in the present scenario. The stablecoin industry has been under fire ever since the terror crash last month. After the disaster, a bunch of stablecoins lost their pegs, raising doubts about their stability in the volatile environment. Traditionally, stablecoins have their values pegged to other financial instruments, such as fiat, commodities and more, so that they ensure their price stability by maintaining reserve assets as collateral or through algorithmic formulae that control supply. The concept of e-stablecoin. Scientists at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California have designed Electricity Stablecoin or e-stablecoin, a fully decentralized token whose value is pegged to that of electricity. And this is for the first time that a stablecoin's value has been pegged to something other than financial instruments. As per news reports, researchers and scientists have stated that the e-stablecoin would essentially be a physics-based cryptocurrency that would link electrical energy and blockchain technologies in a unique way. The e-stablecoin would allow the electricity to be transmitted between users without needing a grid-based system. And this unique stablecoin is aimed to provide solutions to the stability factor through the concept of statistical mechanics. Some of its key features are its users will be able to mint them and they are beneficial to users with low electricity prices. The e-stablecoin is expected to be backed by and convertible into one kilowatt hour of electricity. The entire process is expected to be based on smart contracts in a decentralized cloud storage. The e-stablecoin is developed on the proof of concept consensus and has added the element of reasoning. However, as it's still in the initial phase, scientists believe further advancements could be made depending on its speed, transaction costs and more. Future of the concept. E-Stablecoin has the option of developing stablecoins whose value is pegged to other commodities. A more comprehensive study into the electricity-backed stablecoin could bring developers to work on a similar model in the future. However, for its success in the long run, it's essential to see the feasibility of having such an asset-backed stablecoin. And besides, experts and market participants will have to deeply study the functioning of such a stablecoin. Thanks for joining us in this report. If you do like the information, let us know by liking, sharing and commenting on the video below. Subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, you'll be notified of the most recent videos from Calkine. And also we update our website regularly, calkinemedia.com. Please check it out. My name is Sage for Calkine Media. Crypto talk by Calkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. Cube is an industrial sector company and it deals in logistics. The company is also developing and managing strategic properties into inland rail terminals, bulk terminals and related logistics facilities. 
the KFM Diversified Infrastructure and Logistics Fund was admitted to trading on the Australian Securities Exchange in January 2007. The KFM Diversified Infrastructure and Logistics Fund became Cube Logistics in June 2010. Cube Bulk provides complete mine to market and mine to resupply solutions offering mine road rail storage, port and ship services. Cube handles more than 85 million tonnes per annum of various bulk ores, concentrates, mineral sands, salt, coal and dangerous goods. They also deliver a range of tanker services from pneumatic operations for cement and lime through to bulk liquid tankers for fuel and sulfuric acid. Cube Ports is a major integrated port solutions provider in Australia with bulk and general handling facilities in over 40 Australian, New Zealand and Southeast Asian ports. They are the leader in the market in providing a purpose designed solutions for their customers. That includes handling containers, bulk automotive and general cargo. Additionally, it is a 50% joint venture partner with Patrick Corporation. Cube Logistics provides complete logistics services incorporating road and rail transport, warehousing and distribution, container, parks and related services into modal logistics hubs including rail terminals and global services incorporating procurement, freight forwarding, import and export services. Cube services can be combined as an integrated solution or tailored to meet individual client needs. Cube has a growing portfolio of property assets. Their interest lies in this asset that covers the full spectrum from owner, developer and landlord which is Beverage Intermodal Freight Terminal located in the east of Beverage, 40 kilometres north of the Melbourne Central Business District. Australian Amalgamated Terminals is a multi-user, open access port facility provider supporting the general stevedoring industry. The single largest shareholder in Cube Holdings is HSBC Custody Nominees Australia Limited with a capital holding of 27.64% followed by JP Morgan Nominees Australia PTY Limited that holds capital of 10.33%. Do you think Cube Holdings should be included in your investment journey? Please do let us know in the comments and subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to press the bell icon. I'm Sage reporting for Calkine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Innovation today is crossing the bounds of industries to give way to a much more dynamic future. The spheres of innovation have empowered individuals as well as businesses to look beyond existing realms and opt for new age solutions. Be it highly effective marketing strategies and techniques, novel treatment for cancer, research and development of wellness products or innovating health through natural ingredients, the world is witnessing a paradigm shift when newfangled ways of living are replacing conventional concepts and ideas. In Kalkai Media's upcoming webinar, 
we're putting innovation into the spotlight. Join us live with prominent personalities from three innovative companies who double as Kalkai Media's reputed clients that are leading the innovation charge. On July 28, Kalkai Media will be joined by the Executive Chairman and CEO of Indian Limited, Thien Chu. We'll also be joined by the Founder and CEO of Holistic Coltech, Dr. Rajin Manika, and the CEO of Corporality Global, Priya Mishra as we take a closer look at some of their incredible products and the work that companies are doing. So if you're keen to see how some of our country's top thinkers are ushering in the new era of tech, healthcare and more, then add it to your calendars. Kalkai Media's InvestNest webinar on July 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. Welcome to another edition of Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage and today's guest is Mr. Simon Harrison, Operations Manager at AAPM Media. And business networking in clubs and associations can be highly beneficial to build up alliances, synergistic business ecosystems and mergers. But in the unprecedented times that we've seen with pandemic restrictions and geopolitical issues affecting the climate, sometimes these connections need to be done virtually. So for some background, AAPM Media is a private invitation only social media platform for London businesses to invigorate connectivity. And today's guest will share insights from his work in the space. So it should be an interesting show. Bringing you live today, we have Mr. Simon Harrison, Operations Manager at AAPM Media. Welcome to the show, Simon. It's great to be here, thank you. Simon, we're glad to have you with us today. Could you firstly share your insights on the most optimum strategies to grow local businesses in the present market dynamics? Yeah, you're right what you said. We're in unprecedented waters uh, with regard to business uh, growth. And so businesses need to be able to adapt to the challenging times. Uh, but in addition to that, what we really encourage clients to have is that firm foundation of perceived value for money and superior customer support. A lot of people are somewhat tired these days of uh, automated responses and so forth. And companies that can offer a tailored or a personal touch uh, to assist their clients, often finding just that small amount of percentage uh, superiority over their clients. If I might give an example, some years ago, um, I was talking with uh, perhaps the most famous business directory in the world. Um, Yellow Pages, and uh, they were very reliant on their book distribution um, in order to generate business. But the internet had become the, the hot topic at the time. I mean, this is quite some years ago, and I was speaking to one of their consultants, and I said, why is Yellow Pages still reliant on books when they mostly get thrown out? He said, well, we have a website, and it doesn't feature. The direction, the trend is towards more digital and yet Yellow Pages was reliant on their books. And whilst Yellow Pages still retains a significant market share, they didn't move very quickly in this respect, as far as we were concerned. And what that meant is that they allowed uh, their competitors to gain a, a greater market share. And so that teaches us that when we're in challenging or fluid times, we need to be able to adapt to those times quickly. But the core principles of caring for our clients, of being approachable and offering value for money for our services must be the foundation on which those changes need to be built. Exactly. Thank you for sharing that with us. And in these challenging times, you don't want to lose that quality of service that you aim to offer as a business, I suppose, as well. And also, you don't want to let competitiveness get nasty because sometimes you hear of people clicking on Google ads so that their ads aren't reaching the, the proper clients and customers. So I suppose social networking in, a, in a, a platform like yours can allow for really positive business interactions. It sounds fantastic. And, and social media brings significant marketing prospects to local businesses. Could we talk about how local brands can optimise their social media reach, please? Yeah, I, we've seen a trend over the last year or so to move away from uh, perhaps in the past social media would employ high cost celebrities in order to promote their products and, and that does have value but there's been a trend towards more uh, personal um, interactions. Uh, for instance on YouTube, um, a lot of the personal bloggers and bloggers, they're, 
they're gaining a significant market share because what they're doing is they're speaking um, directly to their customers on a level that their customers can relate to. And that communication is something that's really been the trend in recent times. And so what we've seen is a rise in influencers and people that the audience um, can relate to. And that, that principle can extend to all businesses. What businesses need to do with their social media is be able to communicate effectively with clients. Um, it's not so much just the matter now of, of selling something. It's being able to speak to your customer on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So the challenge for businesses today is to be able to communicate with their customers or their customer base in such a way as that it reaches the heart of people to whom they're speaking, not just their logic or their purse strings. But what we want to do is we want to encourage businesses to use social media to actually motivate uh, people more. And the way to do that is to use examples or you know, to use figures in the social marketing campaign that are on the level of or can relate to those uh, that customers. That's so true and now we're seeing so much more alignment between customer experience as well as employee experience and engagement. So there's that synergy. Please head to Calkai Media's YouTube channel. Until the next episode, keep watching Calkine TV for more of these live expert talks and market insights. Until the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine Media. Welcome to another edition of Crypto Buzz here on Calkine TV. I'm Sage with you today. Hope your day's going well wherever you may be watching from. And Karl Marx said, when it comes time to hang the capitalists, they will sell us the rope. <laughs> there is conjecture that Lenin also said something similar. So what has Karl Marx, the author of the Communist Manifesto, got to do with crypto? Well, it is purported that Karl Marx, the creator of socialism, would most probably support Bitcoin's existence due to its decentralized and democratic roots. However, many argue that Bitcoin is not socialist. What are your thoughts on the subject? Do share in the comments below the recording. However, if you are finding it difficult to take your eyes off the charts during this bear market, do think about listening to a podcast or using an AR meditation app or do some gardening instead to clear the mind. Remember, well-rested eyes and a relaxed mind can be better to make financial decisions with. On-chain analysis company Glassnode has revealed findings that the Bitcoin reserve risk indicator is at all-time lows. The result was reached after tracking market cycles and the risk-reward balance compared to the conviction of the long-term hodlers. It could be said that Bitcoin has not yet existed in a recession. A recession being defined by two consecutive quarters proving negative growth figures such as GDP, which has recently been calculated in the United States of America. With the current levels of the Bitcoin reserve risk indicator being below the 2015 and 2018 slumps in the crypto market, we have to ask, is a Bitcoin at a capitulation event? Well, Bitcoin's price action has been sideways for several consecutive weeks. Its range hasn't decreased below 18,000 US dollars, nor has it exceeded the $22,000 zone for a little more than a few hours. And according to beingincrypto.com, a major capitulation event would lead to a sharp descent in the price of Bitcoin to close to 12,000 US dollars, which would be equal to a 82% or more sell-off. This is more closely aligned to the drawdowns in the previously mentioned bear markets of 2015 or 2018. So how much longer will the sideways price action continue and what trigger is needed to see Bitcoin break out over the $22,000 level mark, which it did do last week, but to actually stay there? These are the questions in the minds of most crypto enthusiasts at the moment. The price of Bitcoin is down 2.8% approximately in the last 24 hours, sitting at close to $19,932. During the Asian mid-session, this data was relevant, it's about 70% down from its all-time high pegged in November 2021 of close to $69,000 US dollars, according to CoinGecko. And please remember, any information presented in this report is for informational purposes only and is not financial advice in any way. 
At present, Bitcoin processes about seven transactions per second. In comparison, Visa cards do about 1,700 transactions per second on average. Lightning Network is layer two technology being built on Bitcoin and this is helping to scale Bitcoin to process more transactions per second and to aid mass adoption. However, we are seeing that crypto credit card holders are on the uptick. According to a recent report whose data shows that crypto credit cards are in favour for their incentives in crypto rewards over the traditional cards. Some popular examples include Crypto.com's Visa and BlockFi's Visa card. Sydney's Immutable will also be partnering with MasterCard to launch a credit card to purchase NFTs shortly. But with the mass adoption of crypto comes more regulation. Even in South America where tens of millions of Chivo wallets have been downloaded for the locals in the last year and payment by Bitcoin is incentivized, the user experience is still clunky and the infrastructure is in some ways limiting and prone to exploits, it was reported by Waste Crypto. Which reminds me that we are still in the phase of early adoption. Internet connection and speeds have only just reached the levels we are at now about 8 to 10 years ago. And crypto adoption is at close to 20% in the United States, however significantly lower overseas. It is expected that a big spike in adoption is still in the future, with crypto adoption closely tracking the rate of internet adoption in the late 1990s. Now news from the regulators. This week presents Federal Reserve Vice Chairwoman Lael Brainard calling out to policymakers to increase scrutiny on the regulations imposed on the crypto sector. Her speech last Friday may have been overshadowed by the parliamentary meltdown which saw over 40 Tory UK MPs, including Prime Minister Boris Johnson, resigning from their positions in the British House of Commons. However, the shockwaves have still caused more investigation into the instability of some crypto platforms that could be turning to unorthodox means to maintain liquidity, falling prey to risks including deleveraging, contagion and fire sales which has been highlighted by some crypto firms ordering withdrawal freezes and bankruptcies. Brainard pointed out that as the traditional financial system is not heavily interconnected with the crypto market yet, there was no major systemic risk at bay. She did warn that stablecoin issuers should be investigated more closely though. And ever since May 2021, being last year, the crypto sector has been under the eye of the regulators with headwinds causing the following major interventions in the sector. The federal banking agencies launched Crypto Sprint in August 2021 with the full agenda set for 2022. And November 2021 saw the President's Working Group of Financial Markets, or PWG, present a detailed report on risks associated with stablecoins. These included the risk of panic similar to that of bank run. And this led to new calls for regulations to limit stablecoins from the TradFi banks. More recently in March 2022, an executive order issued by President Biden on digital assets, paying attention to the definition of security and broker and making note of the innovative potential of the technology associated with crypto, although making sure to emphasize the downfalls of the crypto sector, which has had to clear its name from its dark past, which involved failed black markets such as Silk Road, due to the anonymity of its peer-to-peer -peer payment system. Well, we've now reached the time for a short break, but we'll be back right after this, so please stay with us. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Welcome back. After the break, you're watching Crypto Buzz by Calkine TV. My name's Sage. Solana has been weathering the crypto winter better than most altcoins until recently. Solana is now reportedly being sued by an investor who claims illegal means have been used to make profits by the platform. 
Mark Young is taking the matter to the California Federal Court where Solana Labs co-founders Anatoly Yakovenko and Kyle Samani, as well as its ecosystem which includes Falcon X and Multicoin Capital Management have impinged federal securities laws. The class action lawsuit has alleged the defendants have made illegal sales of Solana's native token Sol as securities without a registration statement whilst promoting the alleged unregistered securities. The price of Sol is down 5.9% today, sitting at $33.64. Over the last 30 days, it is down as well, 0.6%, however. And over the last 12 months, it is up 4.6%, according to data from CoinGecko. If you are looking for themed crypto trades, the DeFi tokens have been doing well in relation to other altcoins over the last week. It was reported by Waste Crypto that about 20 crypto platforms that were previously on the Terra network have now moved over to the Polygon network. And Polygon came into the spotlight after announcing a partnership with social media platform Instagram to launch NFTs. The price of Polygon Matic's token is up 4.4% over the last 24 hours, sitting at roughly 0.579246 US dollars over the last seven days. It's up 17.5%, and over the last year it is down 44.6%, according to data from CoinGecko, being current at the time of writing this during the Asian mid-session. Celsius, the DeFi platform, is reportedly making amends to its bad debt, having repaid 20 million USDC to Aave, another DeFi platform. The crypto lending platform has also upgraded its lawyers to Kirkland and Ellis LLP as advisors on its restructure. This is the same law firm that filed for bankruptcy on behalf of Voyager Digital last week. They will take the place of Aiken, Gump, Strauss, Auer and Feld LLP, who were Celsius's previous lawyers. And according to DeFi tracking platform Zeppa, Celsius still has a long way to go to clear its debt with Aave, with Celsius still owing about 130 million in USDC and 82,500 in rent to Aave, along with a further $85.2 million in DAI to the compound protocol, with a total debt still owing of close to $215 million. And last week, the lending platform freed up more than $500 million in wrapped Bitcoin after repaying $41.2 million in debt to Maker Protocol on July 7th. Celsius token CEL Cell is down today, 5.8%, sitting at close to 0.753656 US dollars. And over the last 30 days, it is up 93%. And over the last 12 months, it is down 87.8%, according to data from CoinGecko. Now, as we start to wind up the show, news from the meme coins, Shiba Inu has come into the spotlight with announcements of new projects, a new stablecoin called SHI, that's S-H-I, to support its upcoming metaverse project, were the two big news bikes that were released via a blog post from SHIB's lead developer, Shaitoshi Kusama. In the famed tradition of trading and collecting themed cards, the ecosystem will also be releasing a new card game, Collectibles, for use in its upcoming metaverse, touted to be called Shibarium. So along with the future stablecoin SHI that will be developed by a team of developers on the network, TREAT, a new reward token, is also due to be released on the Shiba Inu ecosystem. TREAT's main use will be to offer loyalty rewards for the SHIB community and provide stability for SHI, the new stablecoin. It will also have a purposeful role in the Shiba collectible card game currently in development as well. It was reported by B in Crypto.com. So to finish up, the price of Shiba Inu is roughly at 0.00001039 US dollars, being down 5.8% in the last 24 hours. And over the last 12 months, Shiba is up 32.3% according to CoinGecko. So, and that was that. Thanks so much for your company joining us on this week's Crypto Buzz. Hope you found some value in that. Keep watching Calcine TV for more of the market updates and expert talks. And the best way to get through a crypto winter is to keep building. If you're a developer, find ways to connect with protocols that you enjoy learning more about and listen to podcasts and read as many white papers as you can. Till the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calcine Media. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches, 
to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google, to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. Why e stablecoin could be a game changer in the present scenario. The stablecoin industry has been under fire ever since the terror crash last month. After the disaster, a bunch of stablecoins lost their pegs, raising doubts about their stability in the volatile environment. Traditionally, stablecoins have their values pegged to other financial instruments, such as fiat, commodities and more, so that they ensure their price stability by maintaining reserve assets as collateral or through algorithmic formulae that control supply. The concept of e-stablecoin. Scientists at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California have designed Electricity Stablecoin or e-stablecoin, a fully decentralized token whose value is pegged to that of electricity. And this is for the first time that a stablecoin's value has been pegged to something other than financial instruments. As per news reports, researchers and scientists have stated that the e-stablecoin would essentially be a physics-based cryptocurrency that would link electrical energy and blockchain technologies in a unique way. The e-stablecoin would allow the electricity to be transmitted between users without needing a grid-based system. And this unique stablecoin is aimed to provide solutions to the stability factor through the concept of statistical mechanics. Some of its key features are its users will be able to mint them and they are beneficial to users with low electricity prices. The e-stablecoin is expected to be backed by and convertible into one kilowatt hour of electricity. The entire process is expected to be based on smart contracts in a decentralized cloud storage. The e-stablecoin is developed on the proof of concept consensus and has added the element of reasoning. However, as it's still in the initial phase, scientists believe further advancements could be made depending on its speed, transaction costs and more. Future of the concept. E-stablecoin has the option of developing stablecoins whose value is pegged to other commodities. A more comprehensive study into the electricity-backed stablecoin could bring developers to work on a similar model in the future. However, for its success in the long run, it's essential to see the feasibility of having such an asset-backed stablecoin. And besides, experts and market participants will have to deeply study the functioning of such a stablecoin. Thanks for joining us in this report. If you do like the information, let us know by liking, sharing and commenting on the video below. Subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, you'll be notified of the most recent videos from Kalkine. And also we update our website regularly, kalkinemedia.com. Please check it out. My name is Sage for Kalkine Media. Crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency 
has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. Cube is an industrial sector company and it deals in logistics. The company is also developing and managing strategic properties into inland rail terminals, bulk terminals and related logistics facilities. The KFM Diversified Infrastructure and Logistics Fund was admitted to trading on the Australian Securities Exchange in January 2007. The KFM Diversified Infrastructure and Logistics Fund became Cube Logistics in June 2010. Cube Bulk provides complete mine to market and mine to resupply solutions, offering mine road rail storage, port and ship services. Cube handles more than 85 million tonnes per annum of various bulk ores, concentrates, mineral sands, salt, coal and dangerous goods. They also deliver a range of tanker services from pneumatic operations for cement and lime through to bulk liquid tankers for fuel and sulfuric acid. Cube Ports is a major integrated port solutions provider in Australia with bulk and general handling facilities in over 40 Australian, New Zealand and Southeast Asian ports. They are the leader in the market in providing a purpose designed solutions for their customers. That includes handling containers, bulk automotive and general cargo. Additionally, it is a 50% joint venture partner with Patrick Corporation. Cube Logistics provides complete logistics services incorporating road and rail transport, warehousing and distribution, container, parks and related services into modal logistics hubs including rail terminals and global services incorporating procurement, freight forwarding, import and export services. Cube services can be combined as an integrated solution or tailored to meet individual client needs. Cube has a growing portfolio of property assets. Their interest lies in this asset that covers the full spectrum from owner, developer and landlord which is Beverage Intermodal Freight Terminal located in the east of Beverage, 40 kilometres north of the Melbourne Central Business District. Australian Amalgamated Terminals is a multi-user, open access port facility provider supporting the general stevedoring industry. The single largest shareholder in Cube Holdings is HSBC Custody Nominees Australia Limited with a capital holding of 27.64% followed by JP Morgan Nominees Australia PTY Limited that holds capital of 10.33%. Do you think Cube Holdings should be included in your investment journey? Please do let us know in the comments and subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to press the bell icon. I'm Sage reporting for Calkine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV.
Innovation today is crossing the bounds of industries to give way to a much more dynamic future. The spheres of innovation have empowered individuals as well as businesses to look beyond existing realms and opt for new age solutions. Be it highly effective marketing strategies and techniques, novel treatment for cancer, research and development of wellness products or innovating health through natural ingredients, the world is witnessing a paradigm shift when newfangled ways of living are replacing conventional concepts and ideas. In Kalkai Media's upcoming webinar, we're putting innovation into the spotlight. Join us live with prominent personalities from three innovative companies who double as Kalkai Media's reputed clients that are leading the innovation charge. On July 28, Kalkai Media will be joined by the Executive Chairman and CEO of Invian Limited, Thien Chu. We'll also be joined by the Founder and CEO of Holistic Coltec, Dr. Rajin Manika, and the CEO of Corporality Global, Priya Mishra, as we take a closer look at some of their incredible products and the work that companies are doing. So if you're keen to see how some of our country's top thinkers are ushering in the new era of tech, healthcare and more, then add it to your calendars. Kalkai Media's InvestNest webinar on July 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. Welcome to another edition of Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage and today's guest is Mr. Simon Harrison, Operations Manager at AAPM Media. And business networking in clubs and associations can be highly beneficial to build up alliances, synergistic business ecosystems and mergers. But in the unprecedented times that we've seen with pandemic restrictions and geopolitical issues affecting the climate, sometimes these connections need to be done virtually. So for some background, AAPM Media is a private invitation only social media platform for London businesses to invigorate connectivity. And today's guest will share insights from his work in the space. So it should be an interesting show. Bringing you live today, we have Mr. Simon Harrison, Operations Manager at AAPM Media. Welcome to the show, Simon. It's great to be here. Thank you. Simon, we're glad to have you with us today. Could you firstly share your insights on the most optimum strategies to grow local businesses in the present market dynamics? Yeah, you're right what you said. We're in unprecedented waters uh, with regard to business uh, growth. And so businesses need to be able to adapt to the challenging times. Uh, but in addition to that, what we really encourage clients to have is that firm foundation of perceived value for money and superior customer support. A lot of people are somewhat tired these days of uh, automated responses and so forth and companies that can offer a tailored or a personal touch uh, to assist their clients often finding just that small amount of percentage uh, superiority over their clients. If I might give an example, some years ago um, I was talking with uh, perhaps the most famous business directory in the world. Um, Yellow Pages, and uh, they were very reliant on their book distribution um, in order to generate business. But the internet had become the, the hot topic at the time. I mean, this is quite some years ago, and I was speaking to one of their consultants, and I said, why is Yellow Pages still reliant on books when they mostly get thrown out? And he said, well, we have a website, and it doesn't feature the direction, the trend is towards more digital and yet Yellow Pages was reliant on their books. And whilst Yellow Pages still retains a significant market share, they didn't move very quickly in this respect, as far as we were concerned. And what that meant is that they allowed uh, their competitors to gain a, a greater market share. And so that teaches us that when we're in challenging or fluid times, we need to be able to adapt to those times quickly. But the core principles of caring for our clients, of being approachable and offering value for money for our services must be the foundation on which those changes need to be built. Exactly. Thank you for sharing that with us. And in these challenging times, you don't want to lose that quality of service that you aim to offer as a business, I suppose, as well. And also, you don't want to let competitiveness get nasty because sometimes you hear of people clicking on Google ads so that their ads aren't in the media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. 
sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. Hello, I'm James. Great to have your company for the Penny Picks here on Kalkine TV, where we discover lucrative penny stocks. For the second consecutive day of the week, the Australian market rose, gaining around 18.7 points. On the contrary, however, the Small Ordinaries Index was in the red territory, falling by 0.57%. Despite the fall, however, some penny stocks were performing quite impressively, including RMA Global. The shares of this online real estate review, ratings and statistics platform racked up gains worth 61.9% with its share price rising to 17 cents by noon. The development, however, came in the absence of any new updates from the company, with no price sensitive announcements occurring in the past month. Also enjoying a surge in share price was Ballara Rocks. The shares of the Mineral Explorer enjoyed significant gains worth 21.3% and its shares were priced at around 48.5 cents by the noon trading session. The company announced today the assay results from drilling at the Ballara mine in the Lachlan Fold Belt in New South Wales, and the drilling at Ballara is intended to build upon historical results and determine the potential of the project to host significant zinc and copper mineralisation. And lastly, Po Valley Energy is also defying market gloom today, the shares of this oil and gas exploration and development company witnessed a rise of 17% despite any price sensitive announcements. Last month, the company informed the market that it had received penultimate approval for production at its Poder Maillard gas field. Its shares were priced at around 6.9 cents per piece during the noon trading session. And just before we wrap up today's show, let's take a look at some other penny stocks that are making headlines today. The shares of iron ore exploration company Pearl Gold Iron were racking up gains worth 16% and similar to that the shares of wearable nasal technology company RhinoMed were up by 15.4%. On the losing side of the coin, shares of fintech company Sezzle dropped by a staggering 32.5% and the shares of tech company Veeam were also down by 19%. All right, that's all for this edition of the Penny Picks. Another episode is coming your way tomorrow. Until then, make sure to keep it locked here on Calkine TV for the latest market insights and business news. I'm James, reporting for Calkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV. Innovation today is crossing the bounds of industries to give way to a much more dynamic future. The spheres of innovation have empowered individuals as well as businesses to look beyond existing realms and opt for new age solutions. Be it highly effective marketing strategies and techniques, novel treatment for cancer, research and development of wellness products or innovating health through natural ingredients, the world is witnessing a paradigm shift when newfangled ways of living are replacing conventional concepts and ideas. In Kaokai Media's upcoming webinar, we're putting innovation into the spotlight. Join us live with prominent personalities from three innovative companies who double as Kalkine Media's reputed clients that are leading the innovation charge. On July 28, Kalkine Media will be joined by the executive chairman and CEO of Invian Limited, Thien Chu. We'll also be joined by the founder and CEO of Holistic Coltech, Dr. Rajin Manaka, and the CEO of Corporality Global, Priya Mishra. 
as we take a closer look at some of their incredible products and the work their companies are doing. So if you're keen to see how some of our country's top thinkers are ushering in the new era of tech, healthcare and more, then add it to your calendars. Calcar Media's InvestNest webinar on July 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. Carsales.com is an ASX listed company engaged in online automotive advertising and automotive classifieds. It offers an online marketplace for selling and buying cars. The company falls under the media and entertainment sector. Carsales.com was recognized as one of the most innovative growth companies by Forbes in 2017. The company was founded and led by Greg Roebuck and Wal Pichota, and its website was unveiled in 1997. It's become a public and non-listed company in 2000 and it was listed on the Australian Stock Exchange in 2009. CarSales.com has operations across the Asia-Pacific region and it has interest in leading online automotive classified businesses in Brazil, South Korea, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand and Mexico. HSBC Custody Nominees Australia is the top shareholder with a 36% interest, followed by JP Morgan Nominees with 14% interest and then Citicorp Nominees Limited with a 9% interest. The company has a market cap of $5.1 billion. So there you have it, that is carsales.com in a nutshell. Do you think this company should be included in your portfolio? Let us know in the comments and hit that bell icon to stay updated. I'm Holly Shields of Akakai Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. CarSales.com is an ASX listed company engaged in online automotive advertising and automotive classifieds. It offers an online marketplace for selling and buying cars. The company falls under the media and entertainment sector. CarSales.com was recognized as one of the most innovative growth companies by Forbes in 2017. The company was founded and led by Greg Roebuck and Wal Pichota, and its website was unveiled in 1997. It's become a public and non-listed company in 2000 and it was listed on the Australian Stock Exchange in 2009. CarSales.com has operations across the Asia-Pacific region and it has interest in leading online automotive classified businesses in Brazil, South Korea, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand and Mexico. HSBC Custody Nominees Australia is the top shareholder with a 36% interest, followed by JP Morgan Nominees with 14% interest and then Citicorp Nominees Limited with a 9% interest. The company has a market cap of $5.1 billion. So there you have it, that is carsales.com in a nutshell. Do you think this company should be included in your portfolio? Let us know in the comments and hit that bell icon to stay updated. I'm Holly Shields of Akakai Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. 
sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all in our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Australia suspends electricity market indefinitely. On Thursday, Australia's federal government confirmed a primary election promise to cut carbon emissions by 43 per cent come 2030. The Australian Energy Market Operator, or AEMO, has suspended the wholesale selling of electricity indefinitely in order to combat shortfalls which have threatened supply to Queensland and New South Wales. The electricity grid is under severe pressure and residents of New South Wales have been cautioned to reduce their usage to prevent blackouts. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Please subscribe to the channel. Energy Minister Chris Bowen says maintaining the coal-fired power stations will not be an option as they are committed to pivoting to renewable energy. AEMO added that the suspension of the electricity wholesale market will be decided upon on a day-to-day -day basis but will remain a temporary measure. Both Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and Energy Minister Chris Bowen say that no set timeline has been decided on. Albanese says that the current situation is the result of several years of inaction and will take time to resolve, it was reported by The Guardian. Weaknesses in the electricity policy have been exposed at a time when Australia is making the switch to mass electrification. In the aim to prevent price gouging from the electricity retailers, the Prime Minister says that once all the happenings have been examined, they will adjust policy as required. Australia has set a zero emissions target for 2050 and at a signing ceremony on Thursday in Parliament House, the new government confirmed their commitment to reducing Australia's carbon emissions by 43 per cent by 2030. This is symbolic as they are planning to implement a more ambitious set of short-term targets to support the long-term goals which will be sent to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Good news for Australia as recently Australia had dropped back in its ranking for progress to meet sustainable development goals from 35th in 2021 to 52nd country out of 76. Thank you for joining us on this report. If you like the information, let us know by liking, sharing and commenting on the video below and subscribe to the channel. If you press the bell icon, you'll be notified every time Kalkine releases a new video. But for more articles, head to the website, kalkinemedia.com. Sage here for Kalkine Media. Innovation today is crossing the bounds of industries to give way to a much more dynamic future. The spheres of innovation have empowered individuals as well as businesses to look beyond existing realms and opt for new age solutions. Be it highly effective marketing strategies and techniques, novel treatment for cancer, research and development of wellness products or innovating health through natural ingredients, the world is witnessing a paradigm shift when newfangled ways of living are replacing conventional concepts and ideas. In Kalkai Media's upcoming webinar, we're putting innovation into the spotlight. Join us live with prominent personalities from three innovative companies who double as Kalkai Media's reputed clients that are leading the innovation charge. On July 28, Kalkai Media will be joined by the executive chairman and CEO of Indian Limited, Thien Chu. We'll also be joined by the founder and CEO of Holistic Coltech, Dr. Rajin Manaka, and the CEO of Corporality Global, Priya Mishra, as we take a closer look at some of their incredible products and the work their companies are doing. So if you're keen to see how some of our country's top thinkers are ushering in the new era of tech, healthcare, and more, then add it to your calendars. Calcar Media's InvestNest webinar on July 28, 2022, at 12.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all in our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV.
Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Jaskarin Cambo. Now Jaskarin is the founder and president at Spend the Bits. Spend the Bits is a cryptocurrency payment mobile app powered by XRP Ledger, a decentralized open source platform. Now here at Kalkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Good day to you, Jessica, and how are you today? Hi, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Great to chat to you. Very excited to hear more about what you're working with at the moment. So, first of all, if you could start with just telling me a little bit more about Spend the Bits and just detail to us what you do. Yeah, so uh, I'd like to start with my introduction. My name is Jasper Kembo and I'm based out of uh, Edmonton, um, Alberta, Canada. I'm the CEO and founder at Spend the Bits. Uh, I've been working in the you know, IT space from uh, past 10 years now. Uh, and been engaged in crypto space from past three years. While you know involved in the crypto space, uh, I realized that there is a significant gap uh, or problem, you might say, you know, in sending and saving Bitcoin payment transaction. So uh, you know, I searched online for any possible solution and realized there's a big gap in this area. So I started to explore, you know, what can be done to solve this problem. So I spent many months to researching this solution while you know figuring out the pressure resolution. I looked at the Lightning Network, you know, and compared that with the XRP Ledger, and then uh, I came to the conclusion that you know XRP Ledger had much more, uh, you know, uh, superiority, uh, superior technology to offer, and that really gave birth to the Spend the Bits. Uh, you know, I started Spend the Bits with the vision to you know make Bitcoin and crypto everyday currency for a common user by utilizing the you know XRP Ledger technology. Well, it's definitely a very exciting space to be in. Um, although when it does come to cryptocurrency, obviously security is a huge factor. Now, how do you help to ensure that all transactions taking place at Spend the Bits are optimally secured? Yeah, ex excellent question, uh, Rachel. So, you know, uh, every time, uh, you know, when user initiate a transaction from Spend the Bits app, you know, the transaction take place on the XRP Ledger mainnet itself, right? And the XRP Ledger uses proof of consensus mechanism to settle the transaction versus a proof of work or proof of stake, which is, you know, uh, heavily dependent on the network uh, activities. And the user, you know, secret keys are stored locally on their devices each time they, you know, perform that transaction within the app. That makes it more secure to transact. And to you know further add on to it, you know we are a non-custodial DeFi wallet. That means you know we don't save your secret keys information in our database. That that makes you know spend the bits a optimally secured platform. Now we've had a few strange years, obviously with the pandemic, but we have seen a lot of people turning to trading and cryptocurrency. How do you believe that 2021 has influenced the course of cryptocurrency across the world? Yeah, I think uh, 2021 was a great year for cryptocurrency across the you know countries. As we saw many dynamics you know into the crypto ecosystem, some of the major highlights were you know El Salvador made Bitcoin as a legal tender. You know, uh, Facebook is now Meta, and then CBDs are a hot topic globally. Even in India announced you know launching their digital rupee in upcoming years. I think these these are you know these were the you know huge accomplishment and opportunity in the crypto ecosystem. And on that note, we'd love to know what your future predictions are for cryptos in 2022. Yeah, so over the you know last few months, we have seen a huge spike in demand for digital asset space. As we saw, you know, a lot of South American and Asian countries legalizing the cryptocurrencies, and many other current uh, countries have proposed this, you know, as a future prospect. And this will be, you know, absolute pleasure for us to bring all these people, uh, you know, into the uh, world of digital finance. So my prediction for crypto in 2022 to see uh, mainstream adoption for crypto and then see this ecosystem even expand further. And just lastly, we'd love to know what um, lies ahead in your near term pipeline at Spend the Bits. Yeah, so for Spend the Bits, you know, we are a P2P payment system right now. And then, uh, you know, our near future, we are planning to roll out the Spanish version of the app in El Salvador, which is next in our milestone. Uh, followed by the launching merchant portal apple uh, merchant portal app where user will be able to you know pay for goods and services using the stb app and merchant around the world will be able to accept cryptocurrency using the stb merchant portal well it's been very interesting chatting to you today jay thank you so much for your time thank you so much rachel for having me on the show
Thank you and have a good day. And with that, I will sign off for today, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Harvey Norman is an Australian-based retailer engaged in the business of selling furniture, computers, bedding, consumer electricals and communication products. Its principal activities involve integrated retail, property, franchise and digital enterprise. Harvey Norman predominantly operates as a franchiser that grants franchisees across Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia and Europe under three brand names, Harvey Norman, Domain and Joyce Main. This ASX listed company also functions through wholly owned company operated stores. Harvey Norman was founded in 1982 and it has around 270 stores across eight countries, with 193 located in Australia. The retailer was first listed on the ASX in 1987 with its stock under the category of mid-cap. HSBC Custody Nominees Limited is the top shareholder with around a 13% holding, followed by Citicorp Nominees as well with a 7.55% holding and JP Morgan Nominees Australia with around a 5% interest. The company has a market cap of around $4.5 billion. So there you have it, that is Harvey Norman in a nutshell. Do you think this company should be included in your portfolio? Let us know in the comments and hit that bell icon to boost your financial IQ. I'm Holly Shields for Calcai Media. Crypto talk by Calcine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, Continue watching Crypto Talk by Calcine. Innovation today is crossing the bounds of industries to give way to a much more dynamic future. The spheres of innovation have empowered individuals as well as businesses to look beyond existing realms and opt for new age solutions be it highly effective marketing strategies and techniques, novel treatment for cancer, research and development of wellness products or innovating health through natural ingredients. The world is witnessing a paradigm shift when newfangled ways of living are replacing conventional concepts and ideas. In Kalkai Media's upcoming webinar, we're putting innovation into the spotlight. Join us live with prominent personalities from three innovative companies who double as Kalkine Media's reputed clients that are leading the innovation charge. On July 28, Kalkine Media will be joined by the executive chairman and CEO of Indian Limited, Thien Chu. We'll also be joined by the founder and CEO of Holistic Coltec, Dr. Rajin Manika, and the CEO of Corporality Global, Priya Mishra as we take a closer look at some of their incredible products and the work that companies are doing. So if you're keen to see how some of our country's top thinkers are ushering in the new era of tech, healthcare and more, then add it to your calendars. Calcar Media's Invest Nest webinar on July 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. Meridian Energy is one of the leading power providers in New Zealand that generates power from 100% renewable resources. It distributes its electricity to business, industrial, customers and residential under the brand names Meridian and PowerShop. 
Meridian Energy was founded in 1998 and it was listed on the ASX in 2003. It's one of the three electricity companies formed from the breakup of Electricity Corporation of New Zealand in 1998 to 99. The business's stock falls under the category of mid-cap. Meridian owns hydropower stations and wind farms that generate electricity which is sold to the wholesale market. This electricity is then repurchased to sell directly to consumers. Her Majesty the Queen in Right of New Zealand is the top shareholder with a 51% interest, followed by HSBC nominees New Zealand with a 5% interest and Citicorp nominees New Zealand with a 3.5% interest. The company has a market cap of approximately 11.6 billion New Zealand dollars. So there you have it, that is Meridian Energy in a nutshell. Do you think this company should be included in your investing journey? Let us know in the comments and hit that bell icon to boost your financial IQ. I'm Holly Shields for Calcai Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. For to crypto, all you must know about this cybersecurity token. Cybersecurity in cryptocurrency is more important than ever as we have witnessed major hacks recently. Forta, a cybersecurity firm, aims to address this by attempting to create a crypto-first version of centralised cyber organisations such as CrowdStrike. Please subscribe to the channel. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. To achieve its goal, Forta has launched its Fort token, designed to incentivize security experts to keep an eye on blockchain networks. As per coin market cap data, Forta Crypto was down by 20% at the time of writing and trading at US $0.7072 per token. Meanwhile, data like the market cap and circulating supply of the Fort Crypto are yet unknown. What is Forta? According to the official website, it is a real-time detection network for monitoring blockchain activity and security. Forta is a community-based decentralised monitoring network that detects threats and anomalies in real time on Web3 systems, non-fungible tokens, bridges and decentralised finance, or DeFi for short. Forta claims that users can react immediately to neutralise attacks and prevent loss of funds after receiving fast and appropriate notifications about the security and health of owned or dependent systems. To examine all transactions, Forta comprises independent node operators. When a problem is discovered, node operators transmit potential risk notifications to subscribers, allowing them to take action. Developers can use Forta to create detection bots, which can then be run on the decentralised Forta network to find unusual behaviour in every blockchain transaction. The Fort Crypto acts as a utility and governance token of Forta. Also, smart contracts are used along with the Forta Crypto to secure and govern the network. The bottom line. On Twitter, it was announced on June 15th that the Forta Crypto had been launched. It is currently listed on crypto exchanges like Coinbase Exchange, MixC, Uniswap and Bybit. As it is a new token, investors could stay cautious of the Forta Crypto as the market is already facing increased volatility. And recently, the valuation of the crypto market fell below the US $1 trillion mark at 5 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. It was valued at close to $900.85 billion US dollars. Thank you for joining us on this report. If you do like the information, let us know by liking, sharing and commenting on the video below and subscribe to the channel. If you press the bell icon, you'll be notified of the recent videos from Calkine. For more articles, head to the website calkinemedia.com. My name's Sage for Calkine Media. Crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. 
If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. Pharma giant GSK, which was previously known as GlaxoSmithKline, and in February announced that it will demerge its consumer healthcare business into a separate arm called Halion. The new company is expected to be listed on the London Stock Exchange on the 16th of July. Halion will offer consumer healthcare products in categories including oral health, respiratory health, digestive, pain relief, BMS, and others. Its portfolio will include brands like Sensodyne, Centrum, Voltaren and Panadol, among others. The brands are expected to generate about £10 billion in annual revenue through sales. This demerger will also make GSK a pure biopharmaceutical company with a focus on vaccines and specialty drugs. The consumer healthcare business of GSK is a joint venture between it and the US pharma giant Pfizer, with GSK holding a majority stake of 68% and Pfizer holding the remaining 32%. Halion will be formed by the demerger of at least 80% of GSK's 68% of holdings to GSK shareholders. And following this, Pfizer will exit the 32% interest in Halion after the IPO. Shareholders of GSK will receive Halion shares on a one-for-one -one basis. Halion is expected to be a constituent of the same indices as GSK, including the blue chip FTSE 100. At the market close on July 18, the indices with a fixed number of listed stocks will be ranked according to the closing prices, and the stock occupying the lowest position will be removed after a two-day notice. According to FTSE Russell, GSK will undertake a share consolidation to maintain consistent pricing after the completion of the demerger. In the first quarter of 2022, GSK posted a strong growth across both its biopharma and consumer healthcare divisions. It reported a total turnover of £9.7 billion in the first quarter, including £7.1 billion from biopharma and £2.6 from consumer healthcare. The total operating profit climbed to £2.8 billion during the period. And now as for its full-year guidance, the company expects to deliver a growth of 5-7% to in sales. This guidance excludes revenues generated from COVID-19 solutions. The London headquartered company holds a market cap of £87.3 billion, and in the past one year, it's given the shareholders a return of 19%. Its year-to-date return stands at 5.71%. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon to stay updated and boost your financial IQ. I'm Holly Shields for Calcai Media.